This is the Sons of UCF podcast, your place for UCF sports talk year-round. Now, here is Adam and Mike. All right, now you have uh, discovered the 143rd edition of the Sons of UCF. My name is Adam, and as always, your friend and mine, Mr. UCF Mike, is back for yet another week. Good evening, Michael. How are you? Fired up, baby. We're that much closer to kickoff. I cannot wait. How many days away are we? Give me the countdown. 18? 17? You don't even know. No. How excited you are, too. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> just over two weeks. <laughs> which is which is 17 or 18 i think if i have my math right on that exactly. let's see that's one that's 14 15 16 17 17 days now we're recording this on monday so this may not make sense to you if you're listening to like on wednesday uh, so as of monday 17 days but you don't come to us for your math equations you come to us for your ucf talk and we we are happy to oblige in the, this particular episode my cow of the week at the end as always uh we've got uh we've got the uh, the official release of your votes. We tabulated your votes in the part one of the preseason. Sunny's the sort of the prop bet edition. I have the official formal results. We'll read those. It's a, a tradition unlike any other. We go game by game and tell you our uh, our win loss record. So I'll let Mike explain to you how we go fifteen and zero. And every year he comes up with a new uh, a, a new factor. We'll do uh, we'll do some news and notes. Some uh, some tough news off the top. And then, um, like, we are expecting Nick Patty to join us in the show as well. Uh, the Probably the only tie-in I could really find between UCF and Boise, for those who don't remember, Nick Patty actually went to Boise two seasons, transferred to UCF. Uh, so we can call this the Nick Patty Bowl, if you want, Mike. That is what's on store, uh, or in store. I don't know, I'm sure if it's on store. In store for the 143rd edition. How do you think it's going to go? Sounds great. I mean, we haven't recorded any of it yet. There was a time where we used to record the beginning at the very end, so I could tell you how the show was. Yeah. I, we can't do that anymore, so yeah. who knows how it's going to go. Who knows how it's going to go. Whatever happens, make sure you do us a couple of favors. Follow us on all that social media stuff, at Sons of UCF. We definitely appreciate that. Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Uh, go to our website, twonightsmedia.com. Follow Mike on Twitter, at UCFMike1. And don't forget, Thursdays, our live show with, uh, with our good friend Trace Trilco airs on the internet. That is Twitter, that is Facebook, that is YouTube. You can find us all there. And if you're listening to us on one of those uh, fancy schmancy podcast streaming situations, go ahead and hit the follow button. Maybe give us a couple of, of reviews, a couple of likes, five stars wouldn't hurt anybody, and uh, and we would appreciate that, Mike. So, uh, and let's uh, let's get right into the the news, Mike. So we record these on Monday evenings, and here's a little peek behind the curtain on how the show works. We come up with a little bit of a rundown, usually like the day before, and we always kind of leave a little room and we say, hey, if anything you know interesting happens during the day. We'll add it in there. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't, Mike. Well, today, this show is one of those when, unfortunately, something has happened. Uh, about an hour before we recorded, Jason Beatty from 24-7 Sports uh, is reporting. Sources have told him that R.J. Harvey, uh, one of the presumed lead running backs for UCF, suffered a significant knee injury and will be out for the season, Mike. So R.J. Harvey, according to Jason Beatty, will not be playing this season with a knee injury. If you're scoring at home, that's the second UCF running back that uh, will not be participating this season. That's following uh, Bentavious Thompson's removal from the team for we have no idea why. So, uh, Mike, uh, first uh, first info, R.J. Harvey not playing. That means what? Well, that means we're one less guy deep on the running back spot, which is not good. But as we discussed in past weeks, that is probably our deepest position on the roster. But yet, here we go. The season hasn't even started yet, and we're already down two guys. Definitely not a good thing. R.J. Harvey was somebody we had big hopes for this season. We had a big spring camp. He was looking good so far this year in, in the fall. Uh, somebody that could do some trick plays because he's got some experience being a quarterback. You would have liked to see what Malzahn had up his sleeve with him there. But now he's out for the year. That's a gut punch to us right now. Uh, I remember when we used to take these football, the coaching football class with Torchy. You know what he used to always say, right? What is football? A war of attrition. He said that, I think, every class. And usually it, it happens during the season. Sometimes you get these preseason injuries. You hate to see it, but we just got to do next man up. That's, that's the way it goes. We have plenty of guys that can run the ball. So now somebody else is going to get an opportunity instead. Yeah, I mean, so look, losing two um, top running backs is never going to be good news, right? Particularly on the eve of a season, 
um, particularly, uh, you know, where, uh, you know, I assume R.J. Harvey was getting a lot of the carries, uh, obviously Bentavious previously, maybe as well. Uh, so that, that never bodes well. And it's also really the two quote-unquote returning guys who we thought would carry a lot of the load. Uh, that leaves uh, Isaiah Bowser transfer from Northwestern, who is definitely built like a unit, and Mark Anthony Richards, who is coming off some form of a knee injury. I don't know that we know fully his status yet. Um, so those are, I guess, kind of the, maybe the two top guys, uh, I guess. We don't really even know, Mike. We haven't seen a depth chart yet. Uh, Johnny Richardson, obviously, uh, is an option in there. Uh, Damaris Good's an option. And, and people are talking uh, pretty favorably about tr- true freshman running back Anthony Williams out of Lake Brantley. So you're right. Uh, we're going to have to have next man up. But, you know, you got to wonder, Mike. Uh, got, you know, we had Rini and Golia on a while back. And one of the things that he said for uh, for Gus Malzahn's offense is with all the fancy schmancy stuff, uh, Gus likes to run the ball. Gus is a, a run first kind of coach losing another running back and a guy in RJ Harvey, who we saw get a lot of run during the spring game. You know, does this impact Gus's offense? I mean, how, how much did, does this maybe limit what he can do uh, maybe with unproven guys or, or guys who don't, don't have maybe the exact skill set he's looking for? Right. And does Gus have just a bell cow running back? Does he have one guy that's out there three downs in a row? I, I, that's yet to be seen. Do we have any of our guys durable enough to do that? We don't know that yet either. The Mark Anthony Richards, he's coming off an injury. He's still wearing a brace on his leg every day. I don't know if he's going to be able to be out there every down. So it's going to be, have to be running back by committee now. And Harvey, I mean, Harvey was is a big cog, man. We, we thought for sure he was going to be playing a big role this season. And now, before we even kick off a first game, he's out. And there's no question he's out for the year. Uh, it's already been reported he's out for the entire year. There's no hope of him coming back anytime soon, anything like that. The um, the Bentavious Thompson one, still we have not gotten an answer on that. Now, people automatically today start asking, is it possible for him to come back? I have no clue because <laughs> we never got a reason as to why he's not on the team anymore. Was it his decision? Was it the coach's decision? Did he do something? Is there any way now that we're one more guy short, it's possible for him to come back? Is that still to, to be seen? Yeah, it depends, right? That, that's the thing. It's, it's the unknown. Um I feel like what was Gus wording is he he's no longer he's not with us right I think is what the way he phrased it um, you know does that mean there's a path for him back onto the football team does that mean maybe he broke a team rule and he can serve some sort of a punishment whatever that punishment is and is there a path back for him does he have to go a period of time with you know without any issues whatever they happen to be uh, you know the things that was going that were going on for him personally that you know need to kind of take care of themselves and if once that settles we have no idea right and I think. Thinking about Bentavious coming back doesn't do us any good because that, that's a that's a large unknown. Really, the focus now becomes on who's who's next man up, right? You know, does that does that rush Mark Anthony Richards back into the spotlight? Does that does that force a Demaris Good or Anthony Williams into in playing time? Trillian Coles, don't forget Trillian Coles as well. Um, so does that force one of those guys to, to really come in and step up? And you know, how well, how well do they know the offense, Mike? You talked about this. It's a it's a very good point. Every every time we talk about the running backs, um, pass protection. You know, which of these guys can pick up blitzes, which of these guys can, you know, can Dylan count on to protect his blind side uh, with, with younger guys, maybe smaller guys. You, you never know. Obviously, Johnny Richardson's not the, not the largest guy. Neither is Trillian Coles, although R.J. Harvey wasn't either. So, you know, can, can any of those guys grasp the playbook and, and can they be a protector for, for Dylan Gabriel out there? Right. And, you know, running back's a position where you've seen freshmen come in and make an impact right away. You mentioned the freshman on the, on the roster now, Williams. Uh, it's possible. Anything is possible. We saw Adrian Killens come in as a freshman and light it up. Uh, so that, that, has, that does happen. Running back is the position where probably, I said it the other day, I think it's just a reactionary position. You kind of just see the holes and you go. It's not something where it's very intricate, I don't think. It's not like uh, an offensive lineman starting or a quarterback that has to know all the reads and all that stuff. Running back, you give me the ball, find the hole, and just go and let your talent take over. So I think we have guys on the roster that can do it. Trillian Coles is a guy that's been around, seems like forever now, mm-hmm. but we haven't really seen much of him in live action in real games. We had, he had the big spring game a couple of years ago. We've heard his name a bunch of times. And I think I, I don't even know what year he is. He's probably like in his fourth year here. <laughs> I, I don't know if he's technically a senior, but it feels like he's been around forever. Right. Um, so he, he may have some experience um, practice wise anyway. And, you know, we, we got other guys that just need to fill in this hole now. 
I, I believe we have the right the guys to do it. Well, let's put this in context. Just I don't, this is not a knock on RJ Harvey. I feel like I don't want to um, I don't want to make it seem that way. But let's put this in context for just a second. So Isaiah Bowser's are, are by far the most experienced running back on the roster. Again, he played at Northwestern. He's got a career total of let me look this up three hundred and thirty four carries. So he's obviously carried the ball a bunch. Uh, his last season at Northwestern uh, wasn't his best, but he definitely had some experience, right? Then you have Mark Anthony Richards. He's he's got a total of twenty carries his entire uh, college career. Johnny Richardson had 11 carries all last season. Damaris Good has four carries. Uh, Trillian Coles, Mike, has 33 carries. Actually, I'm looking at this. Um, and then R.J. Harvey has three total carries. So while he certainly uh, was somebody we you know we had high hopes for, his body of work wasn't really there yet either, right? So, I mean, while I certainly don't want to lose that, that depth – um, you know, this is, he certainly, you know, he has, he has three carries to his name. And I, I think we all thought he was going to do good things. Um, and, and maybe he, you know, was prized to, to be his breakout year, but that doesn't mean then that Trillian Coles or Damaris good, uh, or even Mark Anthony Richards can't have that breakout year as well. That's right. Breakout years come when you least expect it. Nobody saw the year that, um, Greg McCray was going to have in 2018 until he had it. And then even he started the season, he wasn't getting any carries the first couple games of that year. And then finally, he, he got his chance, and he took he took it and ran with it. So there's got to be a guy in this roster that can do that too, whether it's Johnny Richardson or Demarius Good or Trillian Coles. Somebody that we weren't expecting two weeks ago to have a big year may have a big one. And again, I, you know, I don't I don't know uh, what Gus's propensity to play freshman is, but uh, there were some articles. I think the uh, the SI dot com writer. Um, uh, he he had a piece about Anthony Williams, the true freshman from Lake Brantley, and how how much bigger he's looked, uh, kind of a, a bigger back, and and so maybe maybe that's Gus's uh, thing. I don't know if he'll play a true freshman. I don't know if Anthony Williams is ready for that. Uh, but it's going to be by committee. I think it was always going to be by committee. Now it just kind of brings out to okay, you know, can can Bowser be the guy to to carry the load? You know, um, you know, between the twenties, uh, is he a goal line back? Is that is that where Mark Anthony Richard comes in? Do we have a change of pace with one of these other guys? So we'll see what, what Gus can dial up. We Look, we've been saying that Gus is an offensive, creative, um, sort of a guru, right? Well, now he's got to get creative. He's got to find a way to uh, to, to leverage perhaps an uh, inexperienced running back room and, and make them great and put them in positions to be successful, Mike. Because, look, we saw last year what happened. We, we had a period of time last year where Otis was banged up, where McCray was banged up. Uh, and I think even Ben Tavius Thompson was banged up and you saw how, you know, the offense sputtered at that point when we weren't able to, to get any traction on running the football, running the ball obviously is our, um, it, at least the identity that Gus, I think wants to build. Uh, and so hopefully some, one of these guys steps up, but it's probably going to be a by committee approach. Uh, and maybe Gus just goes with a hot hand throughout, you know, whatever particular game he's playing in. And I don't think Gus limits his running game to just the running backs. I'm, I'm pretty sure he runs a lot of jet sweeps. You're going to see maybe O'Keefe coming down in motion and getting a pitch here and there. You're going to see some running backs getting some action, maybe Amari Johnson. And you're going to see Dylan Gabriel run with the ball. I don't think Gus is scared to have his quarterback run and go with it either. Now, hopefully Dylan's learned to slide because we know the troubles he's had with that the last couple of years. And the last thing we need is for him to get hurt. But, you know, I, I think Gus will mix it up. He'll find a – Somebody that he has confidence in early and he'll stick with them until they prove otherwise. And then if somebody else can step up. Uh, I don't think he's scared to go with any of the other guys either. Yeah, I, I will see. I mean, this is going to be a, a storyline now for the next couple of weeks, obviously coming 17 uh, days before the opening game. Uh, definitely hurts. Uh, obviously, at this point, the transfer portal is not an option, so it isn't like we can just go grab a running back that's off the street there. Uh, that won't be an option for us at this point. Uh, so th- these are the guys we've got to deal with, Mike. And does, does this put even more pressure, you think, on Dylan Gabriel? Does it? Does it? Not that he, you know the the ball wasn't always going to be in his hand anyway, but does this put any more pressure, you think, on on Dylan Gabriel and the receiving core? And if if the running game isn't able to step up the way that maybe we thought they might. I mean, I don't think so. Not yet, anyway. I mean, if the running game gets is getting shut down in a particular game, then yeah, it's going to make us more one-dimensional, and, and that way it may put pressure on him. But I think coming into the year, Dylan's got just as much faith in uh, Johnny Richardson as he does in R.J. Harvey and all these other guys. I think he's got faith in all his teammates. So uh, it's just one less guy that we have to, to count on this year, and it sucks that we have to deal with it. But this happens in football all the time, and it's – one player doesn't make a team. The team has to come together and gel as a unit 
And next guy up, you hear that every time in football. There's no team in football that goes through a whole season without an injury, without a guy going out for the season. Sometimes it happens in week one. Sometimes it happens in week 10. To us, it happened in the preseason. It happens all the time to teams. We're not going to be the only team that this happens to. At some point, Cincinnati is probably going to have a guy that goes down for the season. And Memphis is probably going to have a guy that goes down for the season. We have to deal with ours now. At least we know going into the season what we have to deal with. Well, obviously, the, the bigger news is hopefully R.J. Harvey uh, uh, is able to um, you know get surgery if obviously that's what's needed, and uh, and he can rehab and, and, and get back to it. Obviously, hate to see this for a kid who he was converted from a quarterback, Mike, to a running back. Came to UCF last season. Uh, again, I just said uh, three carries. Saw saw some uh, some very 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 limited action. I think he was just kind of coming into his own as a running back. Uh, you know, positioned I think well on the depth chart. So the, your heart just hurts for this guy, Mike. I'm sure. You know, uh, uh, two weeks and plus before his uh, his season, which might have been his breakout campaign. I mean, that's just that, uh, that's just a kick in the shins. Well, that's what really sucks is this kid personally for him. I mean, all the hard work he put into this offseason, and now he has to go through a whole rehab thing. We just saw what Mackenzie Milton had to go through the last couple of years. Now this kid, and we, we've had a bunch of guys that have had to sit out a year here and there due to injury, and it sucks. These guys dedicate their whole lives to this game, coming up from Pop Warner and high school, and they finally sign with a Division One team, and you know they put all the work in in the off season, all the training, and then boom, one practice and you're out. And, and now you got to sit out for a whole year. And, and then the rehab is what really sucks. Is that, and it's not easy. And it's mentally as tough as it is physically for these guys. Yeah. Uh, it takes a special person to come back from something like this. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and we don't know yet uh, the extent of the injury, uh, you know, w- what it is. So I don't want to speculate, but obviously really ultimate at this point, our, our thoughts uh, are with RJ Harvey and, uh, and obviously the UCF will, will figure out a way to, uh, to try to carry on whatever um, potential um, you know explosion he may have had this season, maybe another guy steps in and uh, and takes that on. So stay tuned. Obviously, as we know more or find out more as as depth charts release, uh, we will um, we will share all that with you. But Mike, on Monday, what was released is the much anticipated. Everybody loves it. That's so well respected. There's never any issues with it. Is the Associated Press top twenty five poll was released. Uh, and uh, our UCF Knights, Mike, received five votes. Uh, well, I guess they have five points. I'm not sure if that's five votes because I couldn't find five. But either way, they uh, they had five in the others receiving votes category, which places them like 38 or 40, depending on how you do the math on that, Mike. So um, the coaches poll, obviously, uh, the week prior, UCF fared a little bit better. Uh, this time around, the AP, which is consisting of writers uh, and columnists across the uh, the country, uh, do not rank UCFS high. I know you ha- hold these polls in such high regard, Mike. Uh, so your thoughts on UCF, um, I guess, being in the 38 to 40 range on the first initial pass of this. <laughs> yeah, well, you know my thoughts on preseason polls. It, it's actually only four guys voted for us. Yes. Three of uh, three of them voted us at, 20, at spot 25. One guy, Eric Hansen, puts us in at number 24. So we get two points for that. Yeah. Totaling five. Uh, Our buddy Matt Baker from the Tampa Bay Times, we mentioned him on the show before. He covers the cows, and he covers uh, Florida State and Florida out there on the West Coast. He actually is one of the guys that ranked us number 25. Um, Our own um, Matt Merchell did not. Yeah, no. He's at every press conference. He's at every – and he he doesn't put us in there. Maybe he just doesn't want to seem like he's biased. I don't know. I have a win after Boise. He may change his mind. Uh, we knew guys like Brett McMurphy were not going to vote for us. We knew guys like Don Williams were not going to vote for us. And, and we really didn't expect a lot of people to vote for us, to be honest. Coming off a 6-4 and four season, the blowout in Boca last year. So uh, receiving votes is fine for now. Um, that's basically what I expected. Uh, so we have plenty of opportunities this season to move on up, starting with the first game. Boise is also receiving votes. So we, we beat them. We'll, we'll jump past them and a few other teams. And then, you know, you got the Louisville game. And, of course, the big showdown with Cincinnati later in the year. So plenty of opportunity to move up. I'm not worried about preseason rankings. In 2017, we were not ranked at all to start the season. I don't even think we received any votes, right? I wouldn't think coming off a six and seven year. And 2013, I another one of our greatest seasons. I don't know if we were receiving any votes coming into that season either. So at least we are on the lips of a few people. We're still getting some respect based on our prior seasons, but uh, I think we're right where we were supposed to be. 
Yeah, four votes. Matt Baker, Tampa Bay Times, had 25. Trevor Haas from Boston got Tom, Boston.com, 25. Adam Zucker from CBS, 25. And you mentioned Eric Hansen from the South Bend Tribune. List UCF at 24, Mike. But the funny thing about, obviously, you mentioned Matt Mirschel. Looks like he's a new voter this year. Uh, he did not vote UCF uh, in there. Again, maybe to your point, he was trying to avoid biases. In, in some of these things, they tell you or they, uh, they they try to tell you loosely who the affiliation is of the uh, of the voter. So the, at, least, at least the bias, if there's any perceived or out there. Uh, so, so those are the four uh, gentlemen who voted UCF. And to be honest, Mike, I think it's fair. Like, I think it's fair. We're a six and four football team coming off of a, a really bad bowl game, uh, a downward year from the year prior. Uh, obviously, a, a lot of other programs had great seasons last year. And, and you know, obviously, this is a lot of its continuation of where you were the year prior. So I can't really argue with that. I think it's actually relatively fair. Would I love it to be in the, in the higher 30s? Maybe. Uh, or lower 30s? Maybe. But I think it's relatively fair. I think to your point, if, if UCF rolls and, and wins their first three or four games, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. You know, I think we're, we're quickly going to be uh, right on the doorstep of a top 25, if not you know, into the top 25 at that point. So I, I think it's fair. I think it's fair heading into it. I, I don't I, I don't know, uh, you know, where the evidence anyone would have right now and go, oh, my goodness. Yeah, UCF is a, a juggernaut football team. I, I think it's fair. Again, would it would we be better suited in those high 20s, low 30s, maybe in my opinion? But I think it's fair to. Uh, I, don't know, I think it's fair to, to assess them at this point right now with uh, with all the very little information that's out there. Hey, coming off last season, you got teams like Coastal Carolina. They're getting respect coming into this year. They're at 22. Uh, Louisiana Lafayette at 23. Both had very good seasons last year. So uh, good for them. You know, if we were coming off the season they were having, we would definitely be clamoring to be ranked as well. But then you got teams like, you know, Texas and Penn State, and they're just based on their names. Miami are ranked pretty high coming off seasons that weren't as great last year. And then you got the usual suspects. The top five, six teams are the same as been for the last few years, Alabama, Oklahoma, Clemson, Ohio state, Georgia, and even Texas A&M. Um, then you get into the little uh, teams that are making the big names for themselves last season mm-hmm. and maybe hoping to crack into the playoff this year, Iowa state and Cincinnati, Yep, well, Cincinnati ranked number eight to start the year coming off a loss in the Peach Bowl. <laughs> so a um, lot of talk out there on Twitter and social media of how we laid the groundwork for them. Uh, we would never started the season ranked this high. What was the highest we started the season? I think 17 or 18. Yeah. And that was coming off two perfect seasons, two perfect regular seasons. Cincinnati loses the Peach Bowl and gets in the top 10 spot. But that's good for us. You know, The higher they're ranked, better for us. They played Notre Dame. Before they play us, Notre Dame's coming in season number nine. If Cincinnati knocks off Notre Dame on the road, and they also play um, Indiana, who is number 17, yep. they win those two games. Uh, depending, They probably can't move up that that much higher because unless these other teams lose. And even if a team like Clemson loses or Alabama loses, do you think they're going to jump Cincinnati over them? Probably not. So Cincinnati's probably stuck in that six to eight range for most of the year unless these other teams really start dropping one or two games. If Alabama loses two, Clemson loses two, you know, Georgia maybe loses two, they, they can jump a couple of those teams. I don't. They're going to need a lot of help to get into that top four. Though. Yeah, you're going to need a, a really terrible loss by one of those top teams, right? Just a, a head-scratching type of loss, uh, I think, to, to vault people in, Mike. For people who are curious, other others receiving votes that are of note to anybody, uh, Liberty, another group of five team, is 36 votes. Auburn, Gus's old team, 32 uh, Boise State, you mentioned seven. Nevada, seven. BYU, six. Ball State was six, which is odd. Houston, the only other American Conference member listed here with five, and obviously UCF with five as well. So uh, a couple of group of five schools in there uh, as well. Uh, Nevada at seven is a bit of a head-scratcher. I don't even know who's on their, who's on their team, who they play. Uh, that's a head-scratcher. You mentioned Coastal Carolina. Uh, they are 22 Louisiana Lafayette, the Raging Cajuns, they are 23. Those are the only other group of five programs outside of Cincinnati listed in the top 25. So obviously a, 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 a you know, uh, an autonomous five heavy uh, poll. Somehow Miami's up 14. I have no idea how. They were 22 at the end of last year. They got seven spots better with a quarterback who had a knee surgery. What do I know? Uh, so obviously the top 25 comes out. The good news is uh, Soren Petro's gone, Mike. He's not voting anymore. Bad news is Don Williams is still there. So uh, we have another year of Don to put up with. Yeah, the Miami is an easy answer. They they opened the season with Alabama. 
That's just yes. give Alabama a little more credit okay. than they need. Not that they need any more credit, but when Alabama beats them 52 to 14 to open the year, it looks better that they beat number 14 Miami instead of number 22 Miami. So that's all that is. Uh, Houston, Houston with just as many points as us coming into the season. Houston is a dark horse in this conference this year. I, I've mentioned before, they do not play UCF. They do not play Cincinnati. They get Memphis at home. They get SMU at home. They have a very favorable schedule. If they And their out of conference is not very tough either. They can be a surprise team. You may end up seeing them in a championship game. It, it's possible if things work out for them, as long as they don't slip up to some team that, that they shouldn't lose to. Uh, that, that's good for us, too. If they, if they can move up the rankings – and uh, Cincinnati can can play well. A couple other teams, maybe even Memphis, can sneak in there later. Who knows? Uh, good for the conference. The conference is getting a little bit more respect, at least. I just love the top twenty-five, especially the first couple ones. Just to, just to see the crazy people that are out there, like Ben Portnoy, who uh, what is this? Uh, the state newspaper in South Carolina has Alabama five, <laughs> which is just fantastic. I'm I'm here <laughs> for that. He's he's the he's the lowest. And then you've got uh, who's this guy? Uh, uh, la, la, la. Sam McEwen um, of the Omaha something or other Nebraska. He's got UCLA 24. UCLA was dreadful last year. He's got them. He's the only person with a UCLA in there. I just love watching how some of these uh, these votes shake out. Uh, and somebody even has um, Nathan Baird, who I guess is Cleveland.com. He has Cincinnati down at 22. So uh, uh, the 28 ranked team, he has 22nd. So it's just funny to see how some of these idiots end up voting and, and kind of what it means uh, and, and how it works. Uh, and obviously it means nothing right now because all you've seen is depth charts and 15 minute practice clips. Sure. Maybe some of these beat writers have had inside access to something and know about something. I don't know. Uh, but again, a lot of it's just checking the box and, uh, and, and, you know, we'll see where it shakes off. I think as it relates to UCF, Mike, I think it's fair. I think it's fair where we are right now, but I think there's, there's plenty of opportunity to move up. You know, coming through these pollsters right now, I just found my new favorite guy. Who you got? And I think he's on uh, CBS Sports, maybe, is the broadcaster. I know the name. Adam Zucker. Yeah, yeah, that's that's our guy. Adam Zucker has us ranked number 25. Yep. You know where he has the mighty Florida Gators? Uh, I, I, I do because I'm looking at it. I want you to tell everybody else. Not ranked at all. No ranking for the Gators. <laughs> he has us at 25. I love this Adam Zucker already. Uh, he's got Cincinnati at 15. You would like to see a little more respect for him there. But um, it's interesting what the hell these guys, how they come up with their their rankings. Uh, they probably Some guys probably take it seriously. Some guys probably don't, especially this preseason stuff. Um, McMurphy is always an interesting one to look at. He's got Liberty there at 24, Indiana at 25. No sign of us. Um, he's got Cincinnati at 14. I, I don't know. I don't, oh, there he is. The Gators and Miami. Miami and Florida are kind of bunched together on a lot of people's uh, polls here, kind of right next to each other, whether it's 16, 17, 12, 13, 14, 15, in that area. So once Miami gets blown up by Alabama, it would be interesting to see how far they drop. And, you know, Florida plays Alabama, I believe, week three. So both those guys – take one on the chin soon well let's uh let's let's quickly touch on camp stuff mike obviously we are in the in the throes of fall camp uh last week uh, there was a scrimmage uh, not a lot of info coming out of it today uh t will terrence williams uh, uh met the media didn't offer a bunch mike basically just said that you know they, they keep playing well uh, and, and kind of, again, was asked a few different specifics, Mike, and uh, is kind of refusing to, to give any details, which is smart to, to do. So not a ton of information coming out. Uh, a couple of guys were, were mentioned by name. Uh, Eric Gillier's name was brought up. Uh, Bryson Armstrong was brought up again. And, uh, and T. Will wasn't biting Mike. So uh, we're not getting a ton of detail out of Gus and T. Will. I think a lot of people, while they've appreciated a little bit more of the um, I guess the, the the way that they answer questions and the way that they handle the media, we're still not getting a ton of information, which in my opinion, Mike, is perfectly fine. I know people are clamoring for give us more, who's standing out, who's doing the best. Uh, but uh, it sounds like Gus and, and T. Will are going to run a tight ship over there. T. Will used one of my favorite lines today. If I tell you, I have to kill you. Yes. Which is always a classic. And, and good for them. They don't have to tell anybody anything. Why should they? Why, why would they give Boise State any kind of advantage, letting them know which guys to scout more closely because these guys are starting. Uh, a thing that T. Will mentioned today, uh, just because the guy is starting doesn't mean he's playing more snaps than the next guy. You may come in second string and play just as much as the, the guy that started at that position. So the, the starter really doesn't mean anything other than 
when the game starts on TV, that they'll they'll say your name. Other than that, it means nothing. So, um, yeah, you know, the the other nice thing I always hear out of him is they're trying to situate the defense around the players they have. They're not trying to force anything into these guys. They're not running a system and say, okay, now you guys have to run this because this is the way we do it. He's going to develop his defense based on the players and based on their strengths. And I think that's the, what best coaches do is run their team based on the personnel instead of trying to force fit something into that when it doesn't work. I, I'm not going to lie to you, Mike. So um, uh, Brandon uh, Helwig does a great job at UCFsports.com. He posts a lot of these, and he posts the written transcripts. So if I can't you know, listen to the video for whatever reason – and if you didn't know who, who said some of these quotes, you would think Hypel, the Hypel translators returned. This was his answer about what he learned uh, from the scrimmage. That was our first scrimmage. So the first time we did live tackling, you can see who ta- who can tackle and who can tackle in space, who's trying to be physical, who can play within the scheme because we're throwing a lot at them. It was good to see. I thought they came out with energy. We want to build upon that and making sure guys get better every day. So what T-Will took out of it is some guys were able to tackle, which is, uh, which is an important part because we struggled with that a few years back. So T-Will really enjoyed people tackling. Uh, but again, everyone's kind of freaking out because we're not hearing much. Even today's 15 minute practice clips, which Trace Trelko does a great job of, uh, of capturing some stuff and putting it on our social media feeds. You're not seeing much, a lot of standing around. Uh, and so it sounds like as, as we get closer to, to game time, Gus is, is tightening up the range just a little bit. And to your point, Mike, why give Boise any more ammo? They have no idea what to expect out of a, a Gus Malzahn led UCF team with UCF talent. So why give them any info if you don't have to? Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's no he up given us the, <laughs> the snap to whistle speech every week. At least he was a little, a little more funny. entertaining. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I do enjoy his press conferences, whether he's telling us something or not, at least he's having fun with it. Um, but yeah, there is no need to tell us or Boise or anybody in the, in the conference that may be watching who's starting and what kind of system we're running. Let them figure it out for themselves as the games go on. So I'm fine with that. Uh, I, I wish that, um, Malzahn would open up more coaches to be available. Seems like it's just him and T will every week. Maybe he knows the other guys may have big mouths and may have loose lips and may let some things slip that are not supposed to. So he, he has trust in T will to go out there and at least entertain us for a few minutes and not give us any information, which is fine by me. Yeah. I mean, you control the message, right? I mean, I think that's, that's Gus's, you know, mantra I'm sure is control the message was out there. He, he knows that T will will say some of the right things. And so, uh, so Gus and T will will handle the press conferences. Have many of them we get left. We're not really sure. Obviously, spring practice or fall practice, excuse me, continues, and uh, we'll do our best to to give you as much as we can when we get it from uh, from our guy Trace Trucko on site or anything else we hear from practices. But uh, let's take a quick break right here, Mike. We'll come back and I'm going to give you the results of your quizzes. You all took a quiz last week, the uh, part one of the preseason sunnies. And uh, I will reveal the results exclusively here on the show. So don't move. The Sons of UCF will return right after this. This is UCF head football coach Gus Malzahn. You're listening to the Future of UCF podcasting with Adam and Mike on the Sons of UCF. Boom. All right, it's uh, Mike. Time to put on your professor hat. I have the uh, I have the answers to the test, the quiz, if you will. So uh, on uh, on social media, I put out the preseason sunnies part one. This is more of the prop bet uh, portion of the preseason sunnies. We'll get to the prediction side, MVP and players, all that stuff here, probably sometime next week, Mike. But this is the prop bet edition, the the more fun stuff. So we went through, we had a pretty good response. So thanks to everybody who took the time to, uh, to answer nine questions, a pretty quick and easy, uh, a painless uh, exercise, Mike. You and I went over our thoughts last week. So uh, if you recall what you said, I, I recall what I said, and I will now give you the results. So here we go, right? First question, Mike, was who will be the first QB not named Dylan Gabriel to take a snap in 21? Quadri, Mikey Keene, and Parker Navarro were your options. And uh, the fans voted, and the winner was Mikey Keene. Just edges out Quadri Jones. 50% of you think Mikey Keene. 43% of you think Quadri Jones. So Mikey Keene is the, uh, I guess, the, the leader right now, Mike, people think, to take the first snap, not uh, not Dylan Gabriel. All right. I believe I said Quadri last week. Um, and like we said last week, it depends on the situation, depends on the score of the game, it depends on if you said – if Dylan Gabriel gets not, his helmet knocked off, he has to go out for a play, and the game just started, 
who knows if it, you know you want somebody to just go in there and run the ball for a play or whatever there, there's a million different ways that somebody else is going to take a snap so it, it's kind of 50 50 and last year we thought it was going to be quadri jones and it wasn't so uh who knows uh i think this one can go either way well, I wonder if this is uh, Night Nation's way of saying that they think maybe Mikey Keene is in line to be the backup, right? Because obviously it's one of two things, to your point. Is this a replay of last year where, you know, we're blowing a team out so good that we're, we're just going to save Quadri and, and if he's the traditional backup and we'll let the young guys get a run? Or is this the, everyone's way of saying that they they think Mikey Keene maybe has the potential to, to surpass Quadri in, in the number two spot in the depth chart? Obviously, you and I have no clue. We see 15 minutes of practice, so I have no idea. And, and maybe this is people going off of spring game performance. I don't know. But uh, Mikey Keene is uh, is your option, I guess, there, Mike. And uh, to your point, we'll, we'll see the situation. We'll, we'll obviously dictate a lot of that. The next question was, who will make the most field goals kickers in 2021? Obarski, Garen Boniel, or Riker, Riker Casey were your options. Mike, do you want to take a guess on who won? Who? I don't think a lot of people have a lot of faith in Obarski. So I'm going to say... Uh, Bonio. He finished last. Riker Casey, runaway. 53% of you said Riker Casey. 35% Obarski. 10% Bonio. So, Riker Casey. Maybe it's the cool name, Mike, but he is the, uh, I guess the, the people uh, think he's going to be our primary kicker in 2021. He probably would have been my guess, too, until when we took this quiz last week, we saw one video clip of the kickers kicking field goals, and he wasn't kicking field goals. It was Bonio and it was Obarski. And I think for that reason, I went with Bonio. If you had asked me the day before, I probably would have said Riker Casey, mostly because of the name alone and what we expected coming out of this year. And how many times did Quadri Jones vote on this poll? <laughs> and how many times did Obarski vote on the backup quarterback poll? That's interesting too. Maybe that's why both these guys lost. That's a great. That's a great point. I'll have to. I'll have to get IT on it to see if I can trace some uh, trace down some IP addresses and get you some results on that. Uh, next one is who will have the longest reception in 2021, Mike? When you and I did this, I made a TD reception. I thought that may be too confusing, so I removed that. So longest reception in 2021. I gave four options, but also gave a, another button. Options were Jalen Robinson, Ryan O'Keefe, Caden Robinson, Amari Johnson, and then, again, another category. Nobody had a write-in vote, Mike, so these were the four that people picked. And the winner was, probably by no surprise, Jalen Robinson uh, comes out on top uh, with Ryan O'Keefe just behind him. Mari Johnson got a sliver of the votes. Caden Robinson, nothing. So uh, Jay Flash, Mike, probably a good choice to have the longest reception in 2021. Yeah, that was my guess. And I, I figure a lot of people probably go Robinson and O'Keefe 1-2. Uh, O'Keefe beat them out last year just because that one play in Memphis. But like I said last week, Robinson can score from anywhere too and he can burn you deep. He can... He can beat you a million different ways, too. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it's either one of those guys. Well, it's a good thing I didn't have a running back question because that, <laughs> that would have been outdated by now. So uh, the next one we had, though, Mike, uh, will UCF have a special teams touchdown in 2021? Uh, again, this is a yes or no option. Uh, and probably not surprisingly, Mike, 85% of the audience said yes. Special teams touchdown coming up in 2021. Oh, well, the law of averages says we're due. It's been a few years now, so... I think that's what most and most people are just hopeful. They, they can't wait to see another one of these Mike Hughes returns. So I, I think we we believe we have guys that are capable of doing it, and we just haven't been able to do it. And plus, I think a lot of people are thinking now with the Nick Toth special teams unit out of here, <laughs> uh, Malzahn prides himself on, on good special teams. I think this will be the year to do it. And and just like anything else, you go four or five years without doing something, eventually it's going to happen. Yeah, plus it costs nothing to hit yes and be optimistic, right? <laughs> so I think it's a it was an easy question to answer. I'm, I'm surprised 15% of people actually said no. So um, next one was 24 and a half receptions from tight ends. So over under 24 and a half combined receptions from the tight end. Mike, do you have a guess on how the audience voted here? Oh, I voted yes, but then after we were talking it out last week, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people said no. Well, either they didn't listen or they don't care. Uh, 59%, almost 60% said over that we will have at least 25 receptions from our tight ends combined this year, Mike. So even though the tight end has not been a staple of the he upple offense uh, as he was here, uh, people are uh, are assuming that we have the talent and Gus will use the tight end differently. So uh, almost 60% of you think that tight end makes a comeback this year. 
24 doesn't sound like a big number, especially when you're considering it's more than one person. So it seems very doable, but when you look at the last couple of years, you often wonder if we still have tight ends. <laughs> that's that's true. Uh, maybe this is just wishful thinking. People just want to see the tight end more involved. Uh, but obviously we did the stats. Hescock has uh, like 21 career receptions combined in his three seasons at UCF. So uh, we'll, we'll see what that, uh, well, that holds true. Maybe it's more of wishful thinking. This next one I thought was going to be interesting, Mike. I'm, the results are actually kind of interesting. Over under 30.5 TD passes for Dylan Gabriel in 2021. Obviously, his first year, 29, second year at 32. Um, so, there, you know, with Gus's offense, maybe he doesn't throw as much. And, and uh, that's something we've kind of thought about. Uh, so, will he have more than well, 30.5? Basically, we have 31 TD passes uh, in uh, the upcoming year, Mike. And the uh, overwhelming majority of people took the over 67% said over 30.5 TD passes. So, people assume he'll be right in that same range as he was last year. Well, it was actually. Well, I don't think we took into account last week when we discussed it. We only played 10 games last year. Mm -hmm. He threw 32. So we're figuring playing a full schedule. Hopefully no games get canceled. That's 12 regular season games. Hopefully a conference championship game. Dare I say, hopefully playoffs. I'm not going to say that because (laughs) starting from unranked, I don't think it's going to happen. But uh, at least 12, 13, plus a bowl game, maybe 14 games. Um so it's pos- I think it's very possible he can get to that number uh, as long as he stays healthy. And we've, we've seen what Gus's quarterbacks have done in the past. We talked about the Tulsa quarterback where he threw 47 mm-hmm. that one year in 2007. So uh, I don't think Gus is going to be scared to throw it around, and we know Dylan can do it. So uh, I'll stick with my over as well. All right, next one was, will UCF have any games canceled or have to forfeit any games in 2021? And uh, 63% of you are optimists and said no. No cancellations, no forfeits. Again, an easy question to answer, obviously. Uh, you, we don't want that. It, it costs you nothing to say, hopefully nothing. But obviously, there's a whole lot that none of us control. But uh, most of you are, are assuming and predicting we will not have to cancel or forfeit any game in 2021. All right. And, uh, you know, the hurricane thing is what always scares you. That can happen any year. Uh, the COVID thing, I think we're going to have games played whether – we have to play them with short rosters either way. I think most of the games are going to find a way to get played. But the the hurricane thing, who knows? I think there's three systems out in the in the, in the tropics right now. And luckily, it doesn't seem like any of them are heading our way. But uh, tomorrow, you can wake up, and there could be two more systems out there. Do you need a forecast? Right now, Fred is battering uh, Apalachicola, my, uh, made landfall. Uh, Grace is going to take a trip to Mexico for vacation. I think Hilda is out there. Uh, or Henry, I don't know his name, uh, and that's going to loop around. So those three will not impact us, but we still have 17 days until at least the first game, and then who the heck knows uh, games after that. So keep an eye on the tropics, my friends. Mike, uh, so we talked AP ranking. It came out today, but this question for everybody was, what will UCF's highest ranking be in 2021? And it was top five, top 10, top 15, 20, 25, or not ranked. Uh, Mike, do you have a guess? I know, I think you said what, top? you had them top 15? Was it where you landed on that one? I had said top 15, I think I kind of talked myself into we could possibly get top 10 if all things broke well. Okay. I think that's our ceiling starting from where we're starting now. Uh, but realistically, I think probably top 15. Well, top 15 was the uh, the majority. 51% of the audience said we will be a top 15 team at some point. So that's 11 through 15, Mike. But the second option actually was interesting. Uh, coming in second with 25% of the vote was top 20. And then coming in third was top 10. So most of you think we'll either be 15, 20, or 10. Uh, so either, uh, uh, and then uh, top 25 got a very sliver of votes, Mike. So uh, most of the audience, half of the people voting thought uh, we'd be a top 15 team. Top 20 means we've lost probably one or two games, right? Top 15, maybe one loss. Top 10, it's an undefeated season. Um, we finished when we beat. Marshall in the Gasparilla Bowl, what did we finish? 22? 21? Something like that? 22, I know we had yeah. a couple other losses. Yeah. And, and that's with three other losses on that season. So um, I think if we, we play the way we should, and, we, and at worst, two losses, uh, that's a top 20 finish for sure. 
Depends on the losses, right? Obviously, uh, it depends who we lose to, which we can go over the schedule. But uh, we can't lose to ECU, <laughs> right? And, and expect to be that that kind of a team. I think that'll probably hurt us if there that, if that happens. So depends on who the losses are. And the last one, Mike, maybe the most controversial, maybe the most interesting. You and I had a healthy debate on this one. Is this Dylan Gabriel's last season playing for UCF? Fifty-five percent of the audience said yes. It is Dylan's last year at UCF. 44 said no, Mike. So majority think that this is uh, the last season for Dylan Gabriel. Yeah, I know a lot of people coming into this year have been saying that. I think a lot of people have resigned themselves to the fact that that, that's what's happening. And they think this is it for him. Um, I think there's still a lot to play for here. And with, with being able to make money now in college, I think is a game changer for guys making this decision. I don't think it's as easy to say, okay, I just got to go for the pros when I can make money here in college and stick around and have fun for another year. Because, you know, when you go professional, it it changes everything. Uh, A lot of guys have decided to stick around. I I mentioned Peyton Manning stuck around for a senior year. If he can do it, anybody can stick around. And he he was a guaranteed number one pick uh, any year he went out. So um, I'd love to see him here two more years. I'd love to see him break every single record and become the greatest quarterback in the history of UCF win a couple of championships, take us to the promised land, win a couple of New Year's Six games, maybe even take us to the playoffs next year. Well, we'll see. Again, ha- uh, more than half of people think that this could be his last season. So uh, if it is or isn't, we should definitely buckle up and, uh, and enjoy uh, whatever the 2021 season will be. And, Mike, coming up next, it's a tradition unlike any other. You tell us how we're going to go 15-0. and We're going to go game by game. We'll break down the schedule. We'll tell you who, uh, who UCF is going to beat. Will they lose to anybody? Who do we uh, who do we think uh, we need to watch out for? Does anybody scare us? Are there some trap games here? We'll go game by game. UCF schedule coming up next on the Suns of UCF as we preview the 2021 season. This is UCF Athletic Director Terry Mahajer, and in my spare time when I'm not on TikTok, I'm listening to Adam and Mike on the Suns of UCF. Go Knights and charge on. A tradition unlike any other, Mike. This is prediction time. We're going to go game by game, and we're going to figure out uh, UCF's record at the end of the season. You're only going to hear it here first. Mike, I know you typically have defaulted to a 15-0 and mentality on these things, so we will see if you have changed your stance, Mike. But what's, uh, are you ready to go game by game? Are you ready? Are you, do you have your, uh, your analyst hat on? Are you ready to break these teams down? I think this is my favorite part of every offseason. Um, just me growing up listening to Mike and the Mad Dogs. I think they were the original guys doing this. That's a win. That's a loss. <laughs> that's a win. <laughs> I love doing this every season. When the schedule comes out, it's one of my favorite days. I do it five months in advance. Now we're only a couple of weeks to kick off. Uh, I'm ready to do this now. All right, well, so here, here we go. Uh, we'll go game by game. Obviously, uh, this is the information we as, as, as of today. So obviously, a lot of things can change, Mike. Uh, but we'll, let's start with the opener. you got to win the first one if you want to win them all. Obviously, we know about Boise State, Mike. They are coming to town. They are 5-2 and two last season. A lot of games disrupted by, um, by COVID and by some other traveling things. Uh, we, we've heard from a lot of the folks in Boise. We've had Boise State um, people, if you will, on the last two live shows. Uh, so we know they have a new coach in Andy Avalos. He came over uh, from uh, previously being their defensive coordinator. Uh, we know there's a bit of a quarterback controversy. It looks like Hank Bachmeyer. He'll be uh, he'll be taking the reins. I think most people assume he's returning. Mike, they do have four offensive linemen returning, but they do have a new offensive coordinator who's going to run a little bit more of an up tempo system. And this is a fun fact for everybody out there: they were last in rushing yards in the Mountain West Conference last year. So the running game was not stout, Mike. So that's Boise making a trek all the way across the country. They've had some COVID concerns as well. We have no idea where we're going to get, Mike. September 2nd in the bounce house, UCF and Boise. What's going to happen? Well, you just mentioned so many similarities between the two teams, the new coaching staff. And remember, we both finished the season disappointingly last year in our bowl games. So – um, nobody really knows exactly what to expect out of either team with the new system. So you just got to go basic breakdown of football. We're the home team. We're favored by four points. I expect it to be a close game. And I don't think it's going to be anything easy. There's no blowouts either way. I'd be very surprised if that happens. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Boise is, has a lead late in this game. You know, and, and 
it's very interesting. Maybe something 24, 21 going into the fourth quarter, something like that. But then I see Dylan Gabriel making a drive to win this game, scoring a touchdown, put us up 28, 24. And then to cover the spread, you know who I'm going to go with our boy, the the big cat, baby. El Gato Grande strip sack. Devon Wilson picks it up, scoop and score. UCF covers the points. We win. Um, what did I say? 35, 24. Okay. Um, I mean, listen, if all that comes true, I mean, my word, go play the lottery. I think, uh, <laughs> here's, here's why I would agree with you. I think, the uh, the home team element I think is going to be a big factor. I I, I think you're correct. I, I feel like this is a one score game heading somewhere into the fourth quarter, uh, and I think this is where the home crowd comes into play. I I think uh, in my opinion I agree with you. Actually, what I wrote down is I think there'll be a defensive play that as it helps UCF seal this victory. I don't know who it. I don't I don't have those particulars mapped out like you did, but I think it's a defensive play towards the end that, that helps UCF seal this game. I don't think it's a blowout by any stretch. I think first games are always a little bit weird, right? You've got some nerves, some guys figuring stuff out, who's really playing, you're getting used to the system. Really the first time you've seen live action, there's no preseason, so you don't have a time to really knock the rust off. Uh, and so you know you, you can't watch tape on a lot of these guys, particularly in a in a new school or you're watching different tapes. So I think it's a it's a weird kind of game. I don't think it's a blowout. I think these are two pretty evenly matched teams. I think the home field advantage helps UCF out. And I think a late defensive stand of some sort, I think, will be the difference. So give me UCF for the victory over Boise. So we both have them 1-0 and after week one, which then brings uh, Bethune to town, Mike. Uh, I mean, I think, do we need to talk about this? Um, they did not play uh, in 2020, uh, so uh, they, they don't have any records to show for. They did join the SWAC conference, uh, and so not a lot of uh, information on them. Like, I think we all think this is probably a pretty uh, pretty easy W for UCF. This is a old-school rivalry. I think we've played them 15 times, if, I'm, if uh, my research serves correctly. I think we're 10-5 and all-time against them. So... But obviously, two teams in completely different places as we were when the rivalry started many years ago. Uh, It should not be a contest. This is a game where hopefully Gus is able to do a little experimenting, mixing things up, figure things out, get a lot of guys some playing time. I see us up early in this one, up big, and cruising in the second half. Maybe this is where you see that Mikey Keene action. Maybe you see Quadri there in the second half. Uh, UCF... I don't know what the spread's going to be, but I expect something, um, you know, high 40s, low 50s to, uh, you know, give give Bethune 10 points. So like 45, 10, something like that. Yeah, I mean, I think this is probably going to be how, however many number of points UCF wants to score, they're probably going to be able to do it in this game. Uh, and this is probably that game where you get some guys, some some run, uh, uh because the the very next week, so uh, if you're looking at the schedule, obviously we play Thursday, then we play Saturday. Then we turn around, Mike, and six days later we go to Louisville. So that's a Friday night game. So this is a perfect game to maybe get Dylan a, a, a half and, and get him out and get him some, some extra rest since uh, we have a short turnaround, Mike, where we head to the Louisville Cardinal territory. We've obviously been there before playing them in the past. Obviously one of our bigger wins came from Louisville. Louisville is coming off a four and seven season. They brought, uh, they brought a new coach in Scott Satterfield who came from uh, Appalachian state. Uh, and so uh, he, he had some off season controversy because he maybe interviewed for another job, maybe pissing people off. Who knows? Uh, they have a, an unproven QB in Malik Cunningham. Mike, he had 15 turnovers last year, 12 uh, INTs, three fumbles. They lost their two top wide receivers. One of the only points of reference I think maybe can help you understand at least Louisville last season. They got blown out at Georgia Tech 46 to 27. Obviously, that's a team that we went to Georgia Tech and handled pretty easily, Mike. So uh, on the road, though, Friday night game, things get weird midweek. Uh, student section, depending upon where we are and pandemic stuff, could, could be pretty crazy. Um, what do you think UCF Louisville week three? Third all-time matchup between the two teams. We did play them once in 1985 and lost that game. And then we all know, of course, 2013 come from behind win on a Friday night, just like this one. Um, I, you know, Louisville, I don't know what to expect out of these guys. You, you brought up what they did last year against Georgia Tech. But they had a couple games there, too, where they beat some teams. And, you know, they were up and down all year. Um, it's going to depend on their quarterback play. 
they, they play Ole Miss to start the season. I think that's the, the Monday night game. That's something we should all keep an eye on. But I, I have confidence going into this game. I know it's on the road. I know it's a short week, but you mentioned we should be able to have our guys rested for this game, coming off the Bethune game. I think Gus can start preparing a little bit for Louisville, you know, a week early. Now, you never want to look past an opponent, but we should be able to handle Bethune and still get some good scouting work on Louisville early. Um, I, I think this is a game we can have some success. Hopefully it's not as thrilling as the last time because I don't know if my nerves can take a game <laughs> like that on a Friday night so early in the season. So so I, I see us coming away with a victory here, um, maybe another 10-point win. So it, it, maybe up – by 17, 20, and then Louisville mounts a, a little bit of a comeback late, but we still hang on to, for a comfortable victory. Yeah, so I think this is a road game. I got a Friday night game. I imagine this will be kind of a standalone game on, on TV. Uh, you know, these things can get weird. I imagine uh, I can see Louisville coming out kind of on a hot start, maybe getting out to a 10 nothing lead or something like that. Uh, just the energy of the crowd kind of getting into it. See UCF chipping away, and it's probably pretty close at halftime. Either we're down a field goal, or maybe we're we're tied at halftime. I think the second half is where hopefully UCF can sort of wear these guys out. Obviously, kind of a a team that's still coming together, still forming. Not not the best uh, team uh, from a defensive standpoint last season. Still kind of working their quarterback in. Uh, so I, I think in the second half is when UCF is going to be able to maybe put a couple of plays on the board. Uh, Louisville makes a mistake or two, and then I think things start to kind of roll from there. I don't think it's going to be a, a cakewalk type of game, though. I think in the you know the third quarter, I think there will still be plenty of game to be played, and I think UCF will just make one too many plays uh, down the stretch and, and maybe a little bit too much for, for Louisville to handle. But I do think it's going to be important. You mentioned the Ole Miss game. If for some reason Louisville beats Ole Miss – now, I'm not saying Ole Miss is a world-beater program, but obviously Ole Miss has aspirations. They have some uh, some returning guys uh, from last season. Uh, so if they can beat Ole Miss, they'll, they'll get a ton of confidence in themselves. And obviously that's something you want to watch out for is if a, a team has a bunch of confidence. But uh, I think UCF can can win this one um, just kind of pulling away towards the, towards the fourth quarter. I think maybe they just have too much uh, firepower. And a, a team in Louisville is still kind of figuring out where UCF's got a bunch of guys who've spent some time together, got fam- uh, familiarity. So I'm going to go with another W here for uh, for the Knights. All right, so we're both 3-0 and through the first three games of the season. And that takes us into a bye week. Death. So 3-0, three, three and oh, all non-conference games. I like where we're at so far. And if we're 3-0 and oh at this point in the season, Mike, we've got to be knocking, in my opinion, on the door of the top 25. Maybe we're in that 27 range, 28. Maybe we're in that 24 range. I feel like, and obviously a lot of other things have to happen. Who knows who else is winning and losing. But I feel like 3-0 and with with two non-cons against a, a a top program like a Boise State, who's always perennially one of the best in the group of five. And then Louisville, uh, I think this the, on the road, uh, ACC team, I think this gets us on the doorstep of the top 25. Yeah, I think we were probably in top 25. Obviously, it does depend on what the teams in the top 25 are doing up to that point. Not all of them are going to still be undefeated. you got to figure the teams 17 through 25, a few of them are going to get knocked off, and our resume is going to look pretty decent compared to some of these other teams. I think on reputation, we should be in top 25 if we're 3-0. Well, 3-0 UCF then would travel up to Navy, Mike, October 2nd. Uh, and uh, you don't need a scouting report for me to tell you Navy is going to run the football. They were 3-7 three, uh, three and seven last year. If you remember, Mike, they were the team that in the very first game of the year, they just got waxed by BYU and their coach, uh, Ken Nimatololo, said they hadn't been practicing uh, tackling anybody, which showed uh, in the BYU game. They got shellacked there. Not a, not a good season for Navy. Obviously, they're, they're typically more of a, a perennial type of program, but 3-7 and seven last year. Uh, they have a young quarterback. They, they graduated Malcolm Perry the year prior, and so I think uh, they, they're finding their way and who's going to replace him. Uh, two of their five offensive linemen um, return, so they're going to have to rebuild their O-line. They have a, a pretty good uh, defensive guy on uh, – uh, on linebacker coming back. I'm not going to say his last name, Mike, because I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm just going to spell it for you. His first name is Diego. His last name is spelled F-A-G-O-T. Do with that what you will. Uh, but he is a uh, he's supposed to be a stud linebacker, Mike. So you know what Navy's going to do. They're going to run the ball. They're going to chop block. The, the, this is a, a weird type of a game, right, because it's, it's unlike any other team that you play. And this is the game for me right here. This is the game where T. Will will earn his money as defensive coordinator. 
because we've seen what Randy Shannon had to do a few years back when we played them. You know, we've seen what uh, even Eric Shenander, you know, somewhat figured out a way to, to scheme up to them. This will be the game that T will earn his money because this is going to require discipline in a scheme that the defense probably will never play again. So, um, so UCF and Navy, Mike, what do you got? What I do like about the schedule is we have the bye week right before the Navy game. And I think you need that extra week to prepare for this Navy rushing attack because there's a lot of assignment football and it's stuff you're not used to doing every week. But I think this kind of plays into our strength this season, this particular season, with the defensive line being the strongest part of our defense that we've talked about the last few weeks. Uh, so I think stuff in the run, Kalia Davis and company up there up front, Stuff in the run, you're not really scared of these guys throwing the ball over the top too much. So as long as those guys take care of business and the offense does their job and puts up a couple points, well, this is a team where if you can get up on them a couple scores, it's hard for them to, to play comeback football yeah. with the style that they yeah, play. They, they just can't. Yeah. <laughs> so if Dylan comes out and fires a couple touchdowns early and the defense is stuff in the run, I like our chances here. I know it's on the road. I know it's not an easy place to play. We saw the tough game in 2017 they gave us. That was a fight all the way to the end. But uh, I think I, the matchup favors us this time, and I do love the bye week leading up to it. 4-0, and baby. We start off the season 4-0. and Yeah, give me a W here. I think, uh, you, well, you mentioned uh, you know, the defensive line. The challenge when you play Navy is you have to be so disciplined, right? Because if you get out of your gap, you get out of your assignment, and that's when they, they slice you up. So while, while we have a lot of talented um, guys on the, on the front line there, they have to be really disciplined. I don't know how many of them have really faced this. I guess Kalia Davis has, but how many of them have seen this style of, of offense and kind of know what to do? So the discipline will, will be huge. And again, don't forget, Navy's going to ball control. So, you know, UCF's probably not going to be able to get as many possessions as we're used to in a, in a typical game with a quote unquote traditional team. So execution on offense is going to have to be high because we, we, you know, if we go three and out, we might not see the ball back for the 10 minutes, you know, if they put together a drive. So I do think UCF comes out with a, with a, with a W the Navy games are always weird when, when we play them just based on their offensive style. But I think UCF has enough to, to get it done. And a friendly reminder to all our friends out there, this game is slated to be on CBS sports network. So carve out about five hours of your time because there'll be like 3 million commercials on this particular game. Like, so four, no UCF, then uh, packs their bags, heads back to Orlando, where they welcome East Carolina for family weekend, Mike. So East Carolina coming in here. Obviously, we know ECU pretty well. Holden Aylers is a guy that had a, a pretty good year two years ago. I think he regressed a little last year. Way too many turnovers. Um, just spoiler alert, whoever is announcing this game on whatever channel it is, the announcer is going to gush over C.J. Johnson, which is one of the ECU's wide receivers every year. Every time we play ECU, that's all we hear about is C.J. Johnson. Uh, and obviously, ECU not a great year last year, 3-6. and six. Uh, That was the game where we had 95 false starts to, to start the game off uh, last year. This time to come into the bounce house, Mike. Uh, this, this feels like an easy one. It feels like where ECU probably is going to be a little bit improved. feels like UCF is going to have too much under the hood. Not so fast, my friend. Oh, this Jesus. is the trap game on this schedule. You're coming off the Navy game where you're known to come off a physical game like that. You may be a little beat up coming off that game. And, of course, you got Cincinnati on the road the next week looking ahead, that whole factor. I, I do believe we're going to beat East Carolina. I don't think it's going to be as easy as we think it's going to be. You mentioned some talent they have at receiver. And we know that our secondary has yet to prove itself. They may put up more points than we're willing to to give them credit for. This kind of reminds me of that game um, a few years ago. I, th- I believe it was 2018. It was a space game against Temple, remember? And Russo kind of lit us up a little bit. And they, they hung with us for about three quarters there. I think we were losing uh, at halftime. I think we were down 35-34 at halftime or something like that. Yeah, that was a little scary game. This kind of gives me that same feeling coming into it. Our team looking ahead the next week. Uh, Holton Aylers is not horrible. He, we talk, we've, he's another guy that seems like he's been around forever. Uh, so we've seen what he can do, and he's got some weapons. Uh, I, I think we're going to win. We're at home. We should win this game. But I think it's going to be closer than people think, at least for a while, longer than we want it to be. And we end up pulling it off something like you know 45-30, but maybe give them – one of these games where they put up some points on us. That's fair. Yeah, that's definitely a a, a fair uh, option, Mike. Uh, well, then you mentioned it. Let's get into it. So this is this is by by and large. I don't think it's hard to argue. This is the big game on the schedule. This is UCF 
at Cincinnati, October 16th. It's a Saturday night. Obviously, you, you know, well, I assume it'll be a Saturday night, but you, you know all you need to know about Cincinnati. 91 last year. The only loss uh, was a Peach Bowl loss to Georgia. They return a lot of guys on offense, including Desmond Ritter and tight end Josh Wiley. Uh, they do have some transition along the offensive line, so they'll, they'll kind of be swinging in two guys. Uh, on the on the O line, probably their biggest loss, Mike, is their defensive coordinator Marcus Freeman is now calling the shots for Notre Dame. He is gone. Mike Tressel, who I think is probably related to Jim Tressel, uh, is their new de- defensive coordinator. But they return a bunch of guys on defense: uh, MyJ Sanders, Ahmad Gardner, and Kobe Bryant return on the, on the secondary. Mike, the secondary obviously has has been a bit of a bugaboo for UCF in the past couple of uh, times we've played Cincinnati. Uh, they seem to have done a good job defensively of locking us up. But again, this was under the Hypel system, right? This was the vaunted, they ran a three three five, and we didn't know what to do kind of thing for two straight years. We still haven't figured it out. Uh, so obviously a whole new ball game uh, up, up in Nippert Stadium this year. Uh, so uh, uh, probably the marquee game on the, on the schedule, Mike. This is, this is the one that everyone will be looking at depending on where we are and what's going on this is a potential college game day type of a matchup mike this is the one for all the marbles maybe is ucf going to beat cincinnati well cincinnati is still undefeated to this point very good chance of college game day at the very least i think it'd be a 330 abc game this is a big one now cincinnati may have a loss or two coming into this one depending on what happens in those out of conference games even if they do lose to Notre Dame and they lose to Indiana, it's still a huge game in the conference. The winner of this game is in the driver's seat. The loser of this game is in trouble because, as I mentioned earlier in the show, Houston lurking there, not having to play either one of these teams. I think if you lose this game, you're, you're in big trouble. You have to win out the rest of the year. I think the loser of this game has to win out the conference the rest of the year if they want to get back to the championship game because of teams like Houston and even SMU. Um this is the one we've been waiting for. This is the one Dylan Gabriel has been waiting for. He has not got this monkey off his back yet. He's lost to these guys twice. Last year's game was a pretty close one. We had our chances there at home. Uh, I think this is the one everybody has circled their calendars for. We've talked to guys in other seasons. We're back when we couldn't beat East Carolina for four years straight. In 2010, everybody knew that was the game. They had – the team meeting leading up to that game, there was no way we were losing it. They went out and took care of business. Uh, I, this is a similar game. I believe Dylan Gabriel is better than Desmond Ritter. I think almost everybody listening to this podcast believes that. I believe that Gus Malzahn is a much better coach than Josh Heupel has been the last two years and will make those adjustments if Cincinnati keeps running that three three five defense. And it's on the road. It's going to be a tough environment. But that's the game you, you, you hope for all year. That's the game you get ready for as a kid. I, I'm not scared of these guys. I say we go in there, we take care of business. It, it's a close one. It's one of these ones where, you know, you're biting your fingernails the whole way, but somehow the, our guys pull it off at the end. And if we're down late in this game, I'd rather be down four than down two. And give the ball to Dylan Gabriel, give him a chance <laughs> and say, hey, we have to go score a touchdown to win this game. And I think that makes the coaching staff be more aggressive in their play calling. I think uh, I have more faith in Dylan than I do in the kickers coming out there to, to win one. So I, I think there's going to be one of those ones where it, it could be an instant classic, man. But I, I have faith in our guys. We, we knock Cincinnati off, and we take the all-time series lead against these guys. We're tied 3-3 all-time against Cincinnati. So give me another W. What is that, 6-0? Uh, that would be one, two, three, four. Yeah, that would be six and zero. Oh. I think. Uh, look, I agree with a lot of your points. What I wrote down here is, uh, I, I think the the one common denominator that we all feel, and again, we're not football experts, but we all have eyeballs. Uh, the one thing that we all feel is that that Josh Heupel got out coached in uh, in many of these matchups in Cincinnati, in particular. Uh, it seemed like uh, Marcus Freeman and Luke Fickle dialed up a system that could defeat Heupel's offense, and we really never had any answers for it. I agree with your premise. I don't think that same thing holds true with a veteran coach like a Gus Malzahn. I do think that the UCF will be better prepared 
to play this game. Look, we talked to, uh, yeah, I think it was Otis Anderson and, and Jacob, and we, we, we asked every time, like, hey, you guys knew this was coming. Why didn't you make adjustments? And I think it was Otis who basically took a no comment on that, right, and said the same thing. Like, we, we knew what they were going to run, and yet we, we did nothing to, to kind of counter it. I think, I think that made it very easy for Cincinnati to scheme us up. And then with the athletes they have, with the talent they have, I mean, I think that that's a recipe for us to, to struggle. And I think in all those games, the name of the game for us was turnovers. We turned the ball over and we gave it back to Cincinnati and we weren't able to slow them down. And then if our offense sputtered, we, we were, you know, we were, we were sunk. I think a whole new system um, changes that this year. So does Cincinnati have the blueprint to beat or to scheme up a Gus Malzahn style offense, right? Obviously they, they owned Hypo. What, what did Pedro Martinez famously say? Call the Yankees my daddy, right? I think, I think Hypo is going to have to call Fickle his daddy in this one. And that's just how this was, but can they do that against a Cincinnati? The only thing that concerns me, Mike is they have a really good secondary. I mean, I mentioned two guys, Ahmad Gardner and Kobe Bryant, uh, a veteran secondary, uh, good playmakers. We, we're going to have a lot of young, potentially inexperienced receivers outside of Jay Flash. So, you know, can we, uh, will our passing game be able to be as effective against those guys, particularly if the receiving core is a little bit younger? Uh, and if now we know about RJ Harvey, does that compromise our running core? So I think this is going to be one of those dogfight kind of games. Um, Cincinnati, while you know, they have some weapons, they're not a high-flying type of offense. I think it's going to be kind of a, a a rock fight type of a game, but I think this is the year. This is the Dylan Gabriel signature game. He he needs one on his uh, on his resume. I think he's been you know circling this one for a couple of years now. I think that they're going to have more confidence in a Gus Malzahn. I think Gus will have them more prepared. And I think this is the time UCF goes in more focused, controls the ball, makes smart plays, and I think they eke it out. I don't think it's going to be a blowout by any stretch. I think it's going to be one of those games where it's back and forth and it's it's nip and tuck, and you know every flag is going to mean something. But I think at the end, UCF will figure out a way to, to pull it out. They take the upset on the road. I think this is the one I feel most confident about because this is this is why Gus is here, to be able to win us these games. This is his first one. I don't think he wants to break. He's gone in and, and beat Alabama at Alabama. I think he knows how to prepare a team. I'm going to go Gus. I'm going to go victory UCF. Yeah, if you want to knock these guys off the top of this conference, you're going to have to go out there and you have to do it on the road. And, you know, it, it doesn't sound – it's not easy, but it's what's got to be done. They beat us at home last year. We can go over there and beat them. We've done it before. Hey, there was a game not that long ago where we – was scored what 52 points in three quarters against them and they stopped it because of the rain <laughs> yeah. I, it these like guys that. last year let's face it they, they were undefeated in the regular season they played nobody at a conference i mean nobody worth anything and they played what two road games all year they, they went to the peach bowl and they lost they, you know they're not a great team it's not like they've been running this conference for 10 years okay they, they lost the championship game the year before to memphis they lost the peach bowl last year they, they've lost some big games, too. They're, they're not exactly world beaters. They're very good. They have a very good defense. But I like our chances against them. Well, yeah, that's not. they didn't blow us out last year. We lost 36-33. I think we were winning at the, at the end of the third quarter, right? Um, if I remember that correctly, I think it was. Let me pull it up really quickly. Uh, it was 22 to uh, – what is that? That's 6. It was 22 to – uh, that's 11, 22 to 25. And we were winning at the end. Well, that's an odd score. <laughs> we were winning at the end of the third quarter. I mean, we, we, we played well um, and, and we were in position to win the game. Obviously in the fourth quarter is when they really put it on us uh, and, and kind of took, took charge. So it isn't like this team has owned us and dominated us and, and blown us off the field. We've been in both of those games. Uh, even the game the year prior, I think we lost 27, 24, right? Like we, we still had opportunities. So, uh, but I think this is why Gus is here. This is why Gus straps it on and says, Hey, you know what guys, it's uh, it's, it's winning time. And he's been there before. I think the guys will look in his eyes and believe him. I think there'll be more confidence because you got to wonder Mike after a while of, of, of not, of, of seeing hypo, not adjust to different things, how frustrating it was for guys. If they kind of got their heads, if they were like, man, we're not going to be able to figure this out. So you got to wonder if that Gus factor will help. So I'm going to, I'm going to give him a boost on that one, Mike, but you you pulled a not so fast, my friend, on uh, on me earlier. Here's what I'm gonna pull a not so fast, my friend, on you. That very next Friday, we come back home to face Memphis. Obviously, Memphis did not have 
uh, the probably the season they had expected last year. They finished eight and three. Uh, Brady White had been there seventeen point five two years. He is now gone at quarterback. They have a new Arizona uh, transfer. Grant Gannell is coming in. Uh, they still have a big play wide receiver and Calvin, um, whatever his last name is. Uh, and their pass defense though last year, I'm like, was not great. We put up forty nine on them, uh, and and Dylan threw for six hundred and something yards. But I think this is that game. This is that letdown game. Memphis is not a bad team. They are a, 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 a above average football team. They can easily win games. They're coming in. Obviously, um, uh, if this schedule breaks down the way we think it's breaking down, we're coming in off a high, off a win. We're probably at that point celebrating a ranking at some point. Uh, and so this this to me has all the makings of a letdown game. That if we don't let uh, if we let Memphis hang around and stay in there and a couple turnovers, a little lethargic on a Friday night. That this one, this one can come back and bite us. So this, this one's got uh, got circled and highlighted on my calendar. So you're marking it as a loss. Is that what I'm hearing? Not just yet. Hold on. Wait for it. <laughs> All right, a letdown game. That's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it. Revenge game. We owe these guys from last year. We blew that game last year. More than they came back and won it, we blew it. I believe our win probability was at a hundred percent or ninety nine percent with about two minutes to go in that game. And somehow we lost. And I still don't know how. That, that game still, I think, frustrates me more than any game la- more than any other game last year. Um, Memphis's defense is no good. Uh, Dylan Gabriel must have dreams every night of facing that defense. He put up 650 total yards himself. So if we get any semblance of a defense in that game, I, I like our chances. It's a night game. It's at home. You know, if, we, or if we're coming off a, a win at Cincinnati – the, the crowd and the team is just going to be hyped out of their minds going into that game. It's the space game. You know, that drives up people even further. So I, I expect us to, to beat down Memphis. I'm not really that scared of Memphis this year. I didn't think they were that good last year. I think they're trending downwards. They beat us for the first time since, what, 1990 was the other, only other time they beat us. We beat them, what, 13 times in a row in between. I think it's time for us to establish our dominance against them again. I, I am less scared of the Memphis team this year than I have been in a while. And in 2017, yes, we had the memorable championship game against them. But earlier in that season, we also beat the crap out of them. I was like 40 to 7 early in the year. Um, I don't know if it's going to be that ugly of a beating, but I expect us to beat them pretty handily. Yes, I, I'm not scared of Memphis. I'm scared of us. I'm scared of a slow start, a couple of turnovers. I, t- to me, this is a game, and and this is I have no inside information. Obviously, I think we're losing at the end of the third quarter. I think we're I think we're down. Maybe a field goal, maybe a touchdown. I think we will eke it out in the end. I think it'll be much harder than it needs to be. But I, I think if if we're six and zero coming to this game after you know beating the the Cincinnati team and getting that, that monkey off of our back, if you will. I think Memphis can catch us a little bit. I think they'll have enough talent. You know, they, they have some guys who can play. I, I think we get a little lethargic. I think we sneak this one out, Mike, but I think this one's a lot closer. Uh, and one of those where we're on the third quarter throwing stuff at the TV being like, what are you guys doing? Wake up. How can this happen? Uh, I think this is a, a, one of those cardiac style games. I think UCF ekes it out, but I think you're looking at like a, a 38, 34 type of uh, type of a win in the end. That's he up all era stuff. I know you're you got uh, you know a little post traumatic syndrome coming <laughs> off that stuff. I got a lot of problems. And, and even uh, even O'Leary, if you go back to 2010, the first time we ever get ranked, and then we come home and we, we put up a clunker against Southern Miss. Uh, yes, I, there is history of that stuff. Uh, it's possible. I just I think Malzahn's going to have this team. If we're six and zero coming off that win in Cincy, uh, I think he'll have his team ready to go with no letdown on a Friday night at home. All right, next up is a, a, a trip to Temple uh, on the 30th. Mike Temple was not good last year. They were 1-6. They allowed 37 points a game, 433 yards a game. They were probably impacted the most by COVID. I think a bunch of games canceled. I think they traveled down to UCF with like 40 guys total. Uh, they lost a lot of their guys. Anthony Russo, their quarterback, he transferred out. They have Daquan Mathis, uh, who came in from Georgia, and Rial Mitchell at their quarterback spot. Mike Memphis, probably not trending in a position to be ready for UCF just yet. This feels like... Uh, uh, even though a, a road game in Philly, you never know, but it feels like this should be an easy one for UCF. The last two trips to Philadelphia have been pretty easy. 2019, we beat them up really good. 2017, but we took care of them too. Um, the, the one that sticks out in everybody's mind, obviously, the 2013 game, but 
they were not a very good team that year either. And we had one of our best teams. And it went down. It had to come down to a J.J. Wharton diving catch in the end zone to somehow stay alive. I don't see that being the case this year. These guys are going to be battling out with the cows, I think, for the seller. Um, I don't see much talent over there in Temple. So I am not concerned about this. Unless this is, I mean, you're talking about, are we in November now when this game is played? Uh, October. Well, October 30th. Yeah. Right? So uh, the weather is, it's possible. It's cold, but I don't think it'd be that cold to be that much of a factor by that time. So, uh, and, and with Temple having the season that they're going to be having at that point, most likely you're looking at a noon game, uh, early afternoon, you know, ESPN three game, whatever it is. So, uh, something, as long as we don't go in there sleepwalking and think, taking these guys for granted, we should be able to handle them. Nice 30 point victory. Next week is homecoming, Mike, November 6th at home against Tulane. Tulane 6 and 6 the year prior. They have a new offensive coordinator, Chip Long. Uh, we saw their quarterback last year, Mike. They found a QB, Michael Pratt. He's a local kid from South Florida, actually. Uh, he played really well, had 20 touchdown passes last year. Uh, they are a team that likes to run the ball. They have like 19 running backs. Uh, a lot of those guys have left. They still have a few of them that are hanging around, but Amari Jones is gone. Uh, and so they, they still like to run the ball. Their defense was not fantastic. They gave up about eight and a half yards of play, but they, they definitely played hard. They played as hard the year prior. Uh, we snuck out with a, with a win on the road. Uh, and uh, in last year's game, I think was, well, I think it was a space game even, right? Uh, and, and they played well. Um, they, they definitely weren't a pushover type of team. Uh, so um, Tulane got some talent, Mike. I think they're, they're trending in the up direction, but is it enough for UCF uh, uh, to, to win? Do you think they can uh, get another W on the board here? This one could be tricky. Hmm. Uh, this one could be a little tricky. I, I did like the way this kid Pratt played last year. He looked good. And now you get him another season. He was a true freshman last year coming on a, on a COVID season where you don't have much of a spring to prepare. Uh, he impressed me last year. So if he's making progress this year too, this could be a tough one on the road, which we, you know, we've had some difficulty there a couple of years ago. It wasn't it's actually an easy home. one. Uh, oh, it's, it's at home. It's also, yeah, it's a home game. All right, so I feel better about it. Okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Forget all that other analysis, bit. yeah. If, if it was on the road, I'd feel a little uh, more nervous about it. At home, uh, I'll give them credit. They'll be able to put up something similar to the East Carolina game where they can put up some points on us, but we should be able to overpower them by the end of the game, by the fourth quarter. Um, I, I, I'll say they put up their share of 25, 30 points, but we were able to put a 40 spot and something on there and pull away late. And win this one. Yeah, I think this is a, a one of those tougher than we think type of games, right? I think if they have the running game, if they can if they can find that again this season, and by the time we get them in November, we'll know whether or not they found that. Uh, and, and and Pratt continues to develop and, and make plays again with a new offensive coordinator, Chip Long. I think he was previously at Notre Dame. I think he's been. Uh, I think he's been around the block, so he's he's definitely a, a guy who can uh, who can coach him up. Uh, th- this could be a, a challenge. I think this is where I hope that our, our depth on the defensive line just starts wearing on on offensive linemen. You know that our our you know if we can run the ball effectively and we can control the clock, I think this is one where we can sort of uh, sort of kill the game towards the end, if you will, and just kind of wear them down. But I, I think this will be a tougher matchup than we think. This is not one of those easy circle W type of uh, temple sort of games. Uh, I do think uh, UCF is the better team here, and you would assume the better team can win. But this is another one where I feel like we'll be sitting on our couch in the third quarter being like, why is this so close? What are, what's going on here? Let's let's get things moving here. Uh, but I, I do think the better team is UCF, and usually the better team should win, especially at home. So I think this one feels like a, uh, feels like a W in the W column. So if you're scoring at home now, we have UCF at this point in time. They're now looking at, what, the 9-0, Mike? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9-0. and Coming into the November 13th tilt where they're going to go play the Ponies in Dallas. SMU, Mike, is a uh, school a lot of people, Phil Steele told Trace and I, not to sleep on, uh, not to sleep on them. Uh, obviously, they uh, they lost some talent, though. They lost their their uh, big quarterback in Shane Bouchel. They were 7-3 and three last year. Sonny Dex is their head coach. Uh, who the quarterback is going to be, I think, will be up for some debate. Uh, Preston Stone, uh, he's, a, he's a name you're hearing. And they also have an Oklahoma transfer named Tanner Mordecai. Uh, that's in the mix as well, Mike. Sonny Dykes obviously runs a bit of a uh, a passy game, a sort of a, a splashy game, but they did have a um, uh, a, a good back last year in the, uh, Ulysses Bentley, who uh, I think can solidify them from a running perspective as well, Mike. A lot of people looking at this game. I think this could be a tricky one on the road late in the season in Dallas. What do you think? Yeah, this is uh, one of the ones that sticks out to me on the schedule too. 
not going to be an easy one. I, I give SMU some credit. They've been a, a pretty good team the last couple of years under Sunny Dykes, and they've been improving steadily. Uh, not having the same quarterback it is a, a, a bit of a worry for them, I would think. But by this point in the season, they should have that part figured out. So this one is going to be a tough one. Uh, we've had some pretty good success against SMU uh, all time, eight and one against them. The one loss in 2011, which, which was an ugly one, but for the most part, we've handled them. We've had some close calls against them, obviously going back to 2013 again, that the freezing cold game at the end. And even in 2017, so two of our better teams, that 2017 game came down to the wire too, where we had to make a defensive stop at the end. So I expect this one to be a closer game as well. Uh, and by this point, our team under Malzahn should have, you know, a pretty good understanding of the offense and the defense should be rolling at this point. So I, I, I can't pick us to lose to these guys after I have us coming this far so far. If we do were to slip up for one on the road, I could see this being the one, but I'm not going to do it. I got to stick with us. UCF pulls one out, 31-27 in a close game on the road. Yeah, this is the one uh, outside of Cincinnati. Uh, I mean, if we get to this part in the season, this is the one that that scares me. I didn't, I didn't share with you, Mike. Do you know who their defensive coordinator is at SMU this year? No. Jim Levitt. Oh, boy. Jim Levitt is their <laughs> defensive coordinator. They've got 17 starters coming back. Uh, the bigger holes they have are quarterback, kicker, and tight end, but they have guys who transferred in to take some of those roles, Mike. I think th- this is the game that really scares me, particularly because it's on the road late in the season. You know, guys could be dinged up. Uh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll we'll see kind of where the rankings are at this point. I agree with you. I think if I had to give you a, a game that I think could be a slip-up, I think this might be it. I'm going to be a homer and say we win it, but I, I'm going to say that with um, like 51% confidence on this one is I think if, if I'm looking at a loss on the schedule, if people say, hey, be objective and take off your UCF hat for a second, uh, I really do think Cincinnati is a game that we can win. I think it's a game we, we need to win, so uh, that one stays for me, but this would be the one I'd give you back if I said if you said I had to pick a loss, this would probably be it, Mike. I, I'm going to say we win it because that's what I do around here, but but this is one that, that has me concerned. Yeah, that Levitt thing kind of worries me too. We have I have bad memories of Levitt. We can never get over the top against him when he's with the cows. Uh, but we owe him one. We owe him a beating. Hopefully, Dylan's up to the task in this one. Hopefully, the weather is not a factor because now we're getting into November here. We we talked about how cold it was in 2013. Hopefully, uh, we're not dealing with any ice bowls here late in the year. All right, so uh, you, we we move on with that now. Ten and zero, Mike. Uh, next up is UConn. Do we even need to talk about that? UConn did not play in twenty twenty. They're now an independent team. They they had a lot of guys transfer out. Uh, obviously, UConn coming to uh, to Orlando. This feels like another one of those Bethune Cookman style games. No, this is the civil conflict, my friend. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize. Conflict. I didn't mean to talk so flip. Yeah, my bad. That's my fault. <laughs> Throw out the record books. Rivalry game, civil conflict. Uh, anything can happen. UConn is well, maybe the worst team on the schedule. I mean, that's the, you're looking at the schedule. The last, the last two games of the year, we've gotten to this point. I mean, I think we're feeling very confident about our situation here and, and getting guys some playing time. We can rest some guys here against UConn and get ready for the final stretch. But um, yeah, th- th- this one should be a no contest. It should be, this one has 62, three written all over it. Uh, anything less than that will have us scratching our heads, I think. So good W against UConn, Mike. And then that brings us to Black Friday, the 26th. Home game, Cows coming to town. If you forgot, they were 1-6 last season. Jeff Scott's first year, Mike. But uh, they have some holes still to fill quarterback. I don't think they figured it out last year. Uh, the, I think the, the the guy who probably played the best, he ended up transferring out. So now they have two options, Cade Fortin. Uh, and then Miami's transfer of Jaron Williams is now there. I don't know if they know who the uh, starting QB is going to be. Uh, all five of their offensive linemen are back. I'm not sure if that's good news, uh, but all five of them are back. But their defense was just dreadful last year. They gave up 441 points, uh, yards, uh, 40 points in, in a lot of games. Uh, they do have a uh, kind of a young receiver, Jimmy Horn, that's uh, making folks uh, a little bit more excited. I do think they're going to be improved this season, Mike. Uh, I, I do think they're going to be able to a way to figure out some some more victories. 
Um, I, I don't think this is going to be their year, but I, I think their arrow is probably pointing up and it really can't point any further down than where it is. Uh, Jeff Scott's probably a good coach. I mean, we've seen him do it under, under Clemson. We'll see what he's got. Uh, so I, I do think their arrow is pointing up. I don't know that they're going to be, uh, again, a, one of the top teams, but I do think they'll be improved and definitely more, uh, probably battle a little bit more, particularly in a rival game like this. Well, they gave us more than we wanted last year. Uh, that game uh, was not really fun to watch. It was one of the uglier ones. I went back and forth all the way down to the fourth quarter. At one point, they had the ball, I believe, only down eight with a chance to tie in the fourth quarter. So, uh, But I, I have to say we're a much better team than these guys. We have a much better quarterback. We have the better coach. We're at home. We finally have the chance to take the all-time lead in this series. I talked to Gus earlier a couple of months ago myself, and I made him aware of how big this game is and how we want to run the score up on these guys. Uh, and I will have Trace remind him again leading up to this game if he's at the press conference. So I think this is one where we can just beat uh, – and we say this every year when, it, when we do these predictions and we talk about the Cal game. Is this the year we get revenge? For 64-12, we want restitution. Gus, give it to us. Blow these guys out. Leave no doubt. I want 70, 80 points put up on them. I want to embarrass them in front of everybody and put a cap on what would be a perfect regular season. Yeah, rivalry game at home. Uh, yeah, hopefully, Gus, uh, he's, he's played in a few of these style rivalry games. I think he hopefully understands how to get a team ready. I, I think I think this is always a, a rock fight whenever you play a team that's your rival. Uh, you know, to your point, they gave us all we could handle uh, last year. Uh, the year before that, we beat them pretty handily um, in the bounce house. That was the year that was pushing and shoving and whatnot. So these games are always competitive. Whether that they're you know whether they're one and eight at, at that point again, whether they've got two or three wins, this is the one they want to win the most. Uh, obviously, at this point, if if things have gone the way you and I have spoken about, we have a lot of things to play for. Uh, so this is an opportunity, I think, for UCF to go out and 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 put the nail in the coffin of their rival. So I, I under good God's green, we could be zero and nine, and I would still not pick us to lose to the cows. So we beat the cows. <laughs> we have to beat the cows this year. We can't have tied the series. And then lose to them and then never had the lead in it. We have to take the all time lead in this series and never look back. So we gotta blow these guys out. All right. So by by our accounts, that's a perfect regular season for <laughs> surprise, the surprise. for the UCF night. Well here's the thing. Here, here's the way I look at our schedule. I think our schedule breaks down into three different parts. There's Cincinnati which is obviously the, the, the marquee game in the schedule. That's the, that's the game where we may even be an underdog. We'll probably be an underdog, frankly, uh, in that game. So that, that's the marquee game. That's, that's, that's the one that's probably the most circled, uh, probably gets us the most attention if we win. Then there's got that middle crop of games where there are teams that are, are, are good teams, uh, but teams that we could easily lose to if something goes bad, a lot of turnovers, whatever that may be, right? To me, that's a, that's a Memphis that's a that's an SMU. I'm gonna put a two lane in there, Mike. Um, I may even put Louisville in that category. Those are games where if we don't play right or things aren't kind of going our way, we can easily get tripped up. And those teams have enough talent, I think, to uh, to beat us. Um, and then uh, and Boise, sorry, Boise as well. Um, and then you you think well, even Navy's an option there too, right? But then you have the ones that we should we should win, the must win, the the ones that we should not lose: the Bethunes, Navies, ECUs, Temples, Yukons, and the Cows. So to me, our, our schedule breaks down into three parts. If we can control that middle part, um, I think that's that's the make or break of our season. The teams, you know, previously like the Tulsa's, who we know they're they're pretty good, and if we slip up, they can beat us. I think you got again the Boise, Louisville, uh, Memphis, uh, Tulane, and SMU. To me, are those teams. So if, if we can control those, I think that that's that's our season right there. Well, this season's gonna be a success if we can get to the conference championship game. And forget, I mean, forget undefeated for a second. If we beat Cincinnati, we're in the driver's seat because then we can even afford to slip up against SMU or Memphis or somewhere down the line. We, we can lose a game and still get to the conference championship game, having the tiebreaker over Cincinnati. This way, if we're tied with them at the end of the year, we still get in. Then if we lose to Cincinnati, then it's out of our control. Like I, I mentioned Houston, I keep bringing up Houston. Uh, they, they can run the table themselves and we would never get a shot to get back in. Uh, so the Cincinnati game is huge on many levels. We get past that one. I love our situation. 
All right. Well, I mean, uh, tradition like any other, an undefeated uh, UCF regular season heading into uh, uh, to yeah. the the conference. So save these tapes, friends, and then you can just tell Mike and I how right we were about all the stuff later. What do you think? Are we going to predict also conference championship game, playoff games, all that stuff? Okay? I mean, you, you, <laughs> Ball game? I mean, <laughs> you, you, are you going that deep? I mean, if you if you've got all that research, I mean, you know, have at it. I mean, now that we're here, we're twelve and zero. We're going to the conference championship game. I know. I'll say it. Cincinnati is not there. Yeah. If we have already beat them on the road, I see them slip up somewhere else along the line. Maybe coming back to reality, losing to Notre Dame, losing to us, losing to an SMU down the road. Maybe three, four losses for Cincinnati. And maybe we get a rematch with SMU. Maybe we get Houston like I've been talking about. Um, But that game, being at home, another win, go to at least a New Year's Six game and face who? Who you want to put? I guess we'd have to be in the Fiesta Bowl. Is that the what's up this year well i don't think it'll be peach because since he just played in the peach last year it would probably be fiesta again against uh let's get a, a nice interesting matchup somebody we haven't played before uh somebody like a a usc or a oregon or something like that how's that i could swing that yeah i mean either i want somebody you haven't played before or somebody that we you know we, we want to beat it's talked a lot of trash if miami puts it together somehow and has a decent season and florida puts it together and has a decent season I would say I wouldn't mind the intriguing interstate type matchups, but I, I don't know if they'll, you know, they'll ship everybody all the way out to uh, uh, to Arizona for that kind of matchup. So um, I wouldn't mind. I guess the USC would be cool. Somebody on kind of a, a although that'd be tough to travel. Um, I don't know. I'll, I'll be. Well, I guess it'd have to it have to be a loser of the Pac-12 game. I guess. Well, I don't know if that's possible because the, the winner of the Pac-12 would have to go to the Rose Bowl. Now I'm thinking about it. So maybe you're talking about a, a Big 12 team, maybe like in Oklahoma. Yeah, I was gonna say. So Oklahoma. I don't know if Texas. this. I don't know if this Iowa State team is legit. Um, yeah, Oklahoma. Maybe Texas A and M. I mean, if they're hanging around the SEC, is kind of one of the one of the under leagues. You know, maybe maybe that's an option. Uh, North Carolina is the runner up to to Clemson if they're in the the Final Four. Maybe North Carolina is an option. I mean, we, all the all the times we've tried to play them have never really worked out. So maybe it's a bowl game situation. And technically, I don't think it has to be the Fiesta Bowl. I know that it, that's been the rotation. But I think, uh, unless there's a different rule, once it comes down to um, those other three games, the Peach, the Fiesta, and the Cotton Bowl, they can pick who they want. It doesn't necessarily – I know they put the G5 team has rotated every year, but if we're a big draw and the Peach Bowl wants us, I think they can take us. Just, just because they had Georgia – just because they had Cincinnati there last year, I don't think there's a rule against having us again if they want us. I mean, it's a lot easier <laughs> to, to get to Atlanta <laughs> than it would be to uh, to get out to Phoenix again. Uh, so, yeah, who knows? I mean, plus, it, I wouldn't mind seeing it. I mean, uh, we, what? Uh, what's the national championship this year? Do we know? It's uh, is it Cotton Bowl? Oh, I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure the Orange Bowl is one of the semifinal games, right? Yes. And the Rose Bowl, I want to say. Uh, on playoff locate. Let me let's do the research here live. Uh, and see where the location I mean, is. Dream scenario, playoff game, Orange Bowl. I mean, how many fans can we pack into that stadium against anybody? I don't care who you want to put it. Make it Alabama, make it uh, Florida, make it Clemson, make it whoever. Yeah, so UCF in the Orange Bowl. For well, so oh my the semis are um, Cotton Bowl and Orange Bowl. So those two Even are. Cotton Bowl's not a bad destination. I mean, you can, so if we're, if we're not in the playoff, those two are out of the rotation, right? So Cotton Bowl and Orange Bowl are gone. We can't go to the Rose Bowl, so that leaves what Peach and Fiesta at that point. Yep. So in that case, I would take the Peach all day, every day. Mike, this has been a Peach of a prediction again. Uh, you can just listen in right now and and play this one back for us in uh, in four months and uh, just tell us how right we were. But uh, coming up next, Mike, uh, we'll, we'll talk. Uh, Maybe the, the only common link between these two teams that we could find, and it's a living, breathing human being. Don't move. He's coming up next. Mike and Adam, sons of UCF, that'll move those chains. That's good enough for another UCF. First down. All right, you know uh, these sons of UCF, we do a lot of research. Um, so Mike and I have been hitting the books hard. We've been on the internet. We've been trying to find any possible connection between UCF and Boise State. It feels like there, there could there not be uh, two more polar opposite schools, but 
After much research, we think we've discovered that link, and we're happy to uh, to have him join us on the show tonight. He actually started his career at Boise State, then made a really smart decision, came down to Orlando, where he spent the final three seasons of his career, 14, 15, and 16, as a member of the Knights. He had a lot of different roles for UCF, so we're really excited to talk to him tonight and uh, happy to join, uh, have uh, Nick Patty joining us. The only known link, Nick, between UCF and Boise State. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. I appreciate it. I, uh, I'm a unique mix between the two, I'm sure. Well, let's start with that. Obviously, you are a, a, you know, a highly recruited guy out of Dr. Phillips in Orlando. I know UCF was a school that was, was after you at the time, but uh, you ended up going to Boise. Walk us through how, uh, how that happened. How did you choose Boise over UCF and a bunch of others as well? Sure. So, yeah, really unique experience for me um, had a lot of opportunities both close to home and obviously far away and uh, just as I got deeper and deeper into the process I fell in love with the coaching staff out at Boise State it just sort of really gravitated personally to them and um, you know it was a unique time for me to be able to do something different get out of the nest a little bit do something a totally different experience than what I grew up around being from Orlando so um, shot my shot there and, and it was it was great. It was a great time there. I loved it. Had to have some awesome friendships and great teammates. It was a really awesome experience. And you know, once we um, once we experienced a little bit of a staff change, I just sort of put my foot in the ground and pivoted a little bit. Decided to come closer to home. And that's when we, we rocked it over to UCF. So really, uh, yeah, it's it was it was a lot that went into the decision. But ultimately, the coaching staff out there at Boise really is what grabbed me. You, you knew it was in Idaho, right? Like that's a that's a pretty big change from Florida to, <laughs> right. to Idaho. What's what's that like for you, uh, a Florida kid getting off the plane? I don't even know where you fly into there and getting off the plane and you're in Idaho. What, what was that like for you? Man, it uh, it was absolutely a culture shock. I won't lie about that. It's um, the good part about flying in there is you fly right into Boise and in about 15 minutes you're you're off the plane and where you need to be. So. That's uh, that's the, the the benefit of it, but it was a culture shock. It was certainly, um, you know, I, I won't say it wasn't a welcome change. I love Florida. I'm obviously back here. I live in Southeast Florida now, so um, you know, Florida kid at heart. It was a really neat experience, though. It was a completely different atmosphere as far as like who you're around as a player. You know, playing with now California, Arizona, Texas, the majority of the kids. I think there there may have been one other kid on the team from Florida and only one other recruit in my class that didn't end up even coming out. So, you know, it was, it was everything you'd think as far as a culture shock. I got to experience a lot more things in the social realm that I didn't grow up around. You know, you're in just a different environment completely. Uh, but it was, it was awesome nonetheless. Nick, that blue turf they have over there, for me, the first time I saw it, I thought it was cool. But then now it's kind of just annoying to me. It's hard for me to watch a game. As a quarterback, did you, it take you time to adjust to that? It, with the receivers wearing blue and everything, was it hard for you? It was not, really. I mean, we just spent so much time on it. It, it got to be pretty normal for us. It got to be to the point for us where green green looks a little weird sometimes because we're on the blue so much. But, yeah, it, it's definitely different at first, but we're on it so much you, you don't even tend to think about it, to be honest. It's uh, it's more annoying watching film, I think, than playing on it, that's for sure, just because it, it hurts your eyes after a while. But. Uh, it's it's definitely the pinnacle of what uh, Boise State's all about. It's a cool cool little twist, it, but it doesn't bother you for long. You're pretty used to it. So that wasn't the reason you left then. What, why did you decide to leave Boise? <laughs> no, that wasn't that wasn't the reason for sure. I, I I just decided to leave once we had a staff change. And, you know, after going being out there for three years, you're away from family for a long time. You have a complete staff change. You just kind of see maybe an opportunity possibly to pivot and, and come closer to home, maybe experience something a little bit different. You know, at that time, I just felt it was the right thing for me to do to, to get a little closer to home, come play for the home down team at UCF and um, ended up being a great decision for me. I had an awesome experience at UCF. It turned out to be, you know, at, at some really low times, but uh, <laughs> also I was at the program at, at a time that we, we had a pretty cool transformation happening. So uh, ultimately it was, a, it was a cool decision. Did the Fiesta Bowl in 2013 have any influence on that? Did you think you were headed into like a championship program coming this back home? It, I, I, I'd be lying if I said it didn't impact a little bit. You know, and, and when that was happening, I was already contemplating, you know, making a change. And then, 
you know, you watch UCF in that game and they're just absolutely rolling as a program. It certainly had an impact on, uh, on the way things were going. And, you know, you, you have this vision of what you're walking into as a program. And we certainly didn't, didn't continue that completely the next couple of years, but they've certainly turned it around since. Well, you get on campus, obviously, and now you're uh, you're under George O'Leary, way different than uh, than Chris Peterson at Boise State. What was the difference as you stepped on practice for the first time at a UCF style practice versus what you were doing at Boise? Yeah, I think, uh, and, and to your point, complete polar opposites, just in the way they do things. Both extremely successful and great coaches, but um, polar opposites just in the way that they have an approach. I think you know they both have very similar characteristics where. Their, their practices are very disciplined, very organized. Um, you know, you're not going to have any outliers as far as what guys are doing, what you're expected of, but just the way that they kind of handle the program, I think philosophically was the biggest difference for me to adjust to. Um, they come from very different upbringings. Coach O'Leary from a very old school, very blue collar, very, you know, nitty gritty Northeastern sort of mindset where Coach Pete um, still – very hardworking blue collar, but a lot more, um, you know, modernized, I guess, approach of how to, how to handle, handle players and coaches and, and staffs, et cetera. And so, you know, and, and I think the, the way that the offenses were set up was a huge adjustment as well. Just obviously you guys know, you've watched the two teams play and especially when O'Leary was there, you know, our look for UCF and, Boise's look was polar opposites. You know, with Boise, there's a lot of shift in motion, smoke and mirrors. There's some trick plays, a bunch of exciting stuff. UCF, when I got there with O'Leary, was a little bit more, you know, straightforward, line it up, run the play, you know, and, and it was a little more old school. So that was a big adjustment for me as well. And then certainly moving into receiver, even more, more of an adjustment, you know, so you work from playing a position you played your whole life and then playing receiver, which I loved and was, was awesome. But, um, just go through a lot of transitions in, in that, those couple of years. So really cool to feel, you know, both staffs and the differences there, but um, they were absolutely polar opposites. So it's, it's, we're going on like season three of our show, like three years, Nick. We've probably talked to up to 60, 65 guys, a bunch of guys who've played under the O'Leary era. Everybody's got a George O'Leary story. The first time he got on you in practice, the first time he made you run up and down the stadium steps or whatever. What is your George O'Leary story? Man, I don't know that I can say them all on the, <laughs> uh, on the podcast here. The, the really, really good ones. Maybe they'll save those for another time. But um, I think the, the best George O'Leary story that I probably have, it, it's more of a uh, – there's a video of, of George O'Leary when we, when we would do punt team, and he, was, he's, he holds this, uh, this dummy, and he, he would hit the punters with it. <laughs> and it, it, there's just this hysterical video of our punter getting knocked over by O'Leary. After he punts one, he gets whacked with his bag. And, and I remember one film session. O'Leary, he wasn't one to make a whole bunch of wide scratch during meetings, but I do remember him running this one back a couple times in the, the team room going, going pretty lively. So that's a pretty, that's a pretty good one. Right, well, I'll have to share that video with you guys. Yeah, we're gonna. Yeah, we're gonna need to see that. Uh, on the field, obviously, 2014, uh, Blake had gone pro, so there was obviously an opening at the quarterback spot. Justin Holman was there. Pete DeNova was there. Then you came in. Did, did uh, were you anticipating a a quarterback battle that off season? Did, were you? Do you think you were in the mix potentially to to be the starter in 2014? I did going in. Yeah, and we knew we had an interesting room of some guys that had played, especially Justin the year before getting a ton of reps, you know, with them being as successful as they were. You know, he, he, we, we sort of had a semblance of him walking in being somewhat of the guy. Um, but we were all given a good opportunity that year, and I think, you know, it was, it was really up in the air even going into the Penn State game. Um, you know, we didn't uh, – uh, transparently, all of us didn't really know going into the Penn State game who was going to – one, who was going to start, and two, who was going to be the backup. So uh, it was a really up in the air off season, um, but it was just kind of that kind of year. That entire season was somewhat like that, as as everybody followed. But um, yeah, I absolutely thought I'd have a chance going in, um, and it was it was pretty interesting off season. <laughs> Yeah, Justin kind of took control of the job during that season. We went on a pretty nice winning streak. We win the conference, the share of the conference in 14. But in 15, you're in the spring, you have a pretty good spring. 
but and you're supposed to be the backup, but then they switch you to receiver. Was that yeah. whose idea was that? Was that coaches or Larry's? Did you go to them and say you just want to help the team? Yeah. How does that work? It was a little bit of both of ours. So we were, you know, we, we go through that spring. I had a really good fully had a really good spring at, at, at Q. And then, you know, we just kind of went into that. Even with me playing quarterback, I was, that's when I had started to do a little bit more of some of the Wildcat stuff and some special team stuff. Cause I just wanted to kind of get on the field and use my athleticism and, and doing that is what kind of sparked me going and saying how it just, in, in what way can I produce and what way can I contribute? Um, and that's when it was, hey, you can continue to do what you're doing, and we'll try to find ways for you to get on the field, or you can switch to receiver, and we'll, continue, you know, we'll do all this trickery stuff, and you can play receiver. And I, I was all for that. I've never played receiver before, you know, before that year, and um, you know, it was a really cool experience. I loved it. I thought about staying there, you know, through when Frost got there. It was just I was asked to do a different thing with that staff as well. So it's sort of, you know, you you, you live where your feet are, kind of thing. So. It was an opportunity with them that I took advantage of with the O'Leary staff to get on the field a little bit more, um, you know, right away, and it, it paid off. When you're running the wild night, do you, are you ever tempted to just say, hey, I want to chuck one deep here. I screw this play. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I know I'm supposed to run. But... It was. It was talked about a few times. There was a couple that we had, a couple plays we had drawn up that, you know, with those packages, there's always a couple plays you don't get to run because they're, you know, not set up or whatever, not right field position whatever it may be and there was a couple times that we almost uh did some audibles but <laughs> it was a great package man I, we got a lot out of that thing and, and it wasn't the most successful year all around but i do remember that package was pretty uh, productive what do you think george would have said if you did decide to throw one deep and it, it wasn't called I, for <laughs> i can only imagine i don't know that, I'd, uh, we that we would have been running any more wild night that year but... <laughs> Any, anything else with me on the field <laughs> well like you said like obviously you want to get in the field you want to help the team out but was there any part of you that was i don't know i want to say frustrated but just just wanted to be you know the quarterback didn't want to do this you know a special package or some sort of a a wrinkle in the offense it just wanted a chance to, to be under center and just just be the regular kind of full-time quarterback sure yeah it's a frustrating thing i think especially you know and not, not this is really just a kind of a you look at your own personal game you know as that package became successful and we utilized it a lot, especially in some games that we utilized it, you know, a third of the game, we would run it. Um, you just to kind of ask yourself then, why aren't we just expanding on the offense on this kind of deal and, and letting whoever else run it? Um, you know, but again, I was in a new role that year. So it's like I was in a completely different role, playing a completely different position. So, um, yeah, as much as you're frustrated and everybody wants to be the guy, right? It's like everybody – wants to be the starting quarterback but um i found myself in a really unique role where i was able to help in a lot of different ways that i sort of was trying to embrace in a different way so it was a cool opportunity for me to kind of wear a different hat get behind justin you know and and the other guys that played that year and and um you know help a young guy along the way tyler that year and Bo a little bit and you know so it was a cool year but yeah absolutely a frustrating year well, you had an interesting stat line against Tulsa. Uh, you had a rushing attempt, you had a pass completion, you had a reception, and you had a fumble recovery all in the same game. I have no idea if that's a record, but it sounds pretty cool. Do you lead with that? At, do you lead with that at parties? Is that like your opening line when you're at a party? Hey, by the way, I had these stats in one game. Man, it's usually not. I <laughs> vaguely remember that being a record at the time. Somebody like putting that together, and I, I haven't thought about it yet. until now. I, I'm, I'm glad to you. I'm proud that you uh, you found that somewhere, but that's typically not my claim to fame. Typically, my claim to fame is that I threw Jimmy Buffett a touchdown <laughs> when I was uh, back out at Boise State, came to play a show, and he he was on the field, and so I got to throw him a touchdown. So that's usually what I lead with. <laughs> I guess that's all right. <laughs> I mean, it's not a yeah, fumble recovery. Right. It's definitely not yeah, it's a not fumble bad. recovery against Tulsa. Well, I mean, <laughs> well, we could use some of that. The last couple of years, we could definitely use some fumble recoveries against That's Tulsa. True. Um, no doubt. Well, you mentioned obviously, fifteen does not end the way anybody wants it to end. We go, we, you know, winless that year. Uh, was there a part of you that were, was kind of rethinking your decision to come to UCF? Obviously, at that point, you had one year left eligibility. Was there a part of you saying like, "Hey, am I in the right spot?" Were you? Was there any inclination of you kind of looking around saying like, "Hey, maybe I want to try something different for my last year"? No, there really wasn't. Yeah, there really wasn't a time that that happened. I, um, you know, obviously coming through that year, that's about as tough a year as you could probably embrace as an athlete. 
Um, but I was, I was in such a great place with UCF. You know, I, I really was happy that I made the decision to come there being in my hometown college and, and having that sort of experience was second to none for me. And so as tough as that year was, I, there was never a doubt that I was going to, I was going to, you know, hold out for that last year and, and finish there. You know, I had a really cool experience at UCF. We did some really awesome stuff and, you know, it's a, watching the school grow on my way out. I'm really glad that I didn't think to leave, but um, it wasn't, no, it wasn't really an option. I, there was some, chatter about it and, and options but i i was never gonna never gonna do that especially for my last year plus you know you make you make some some bonds and friendships that you want to see through and um we had some we had a pretty cool little team dynamic by that time and, and having to experience being able to experience scott frost for one year you know once we found out that he was going to be the guy that was um, a pretty surreal experience for the program i mean talking about like an instant shot of life for a program that was cool to experience yeah, so when Frost comes in, do you think – and they put you back at quarterback. Do you think you got a shot to start again? Or were you just getting comfortable at receiver and you wanted to stick around there? Man, it was a, it was a long conversation, and we went back and forth about it a couple times. And um, Yeah, seeing their offense, obviously, as a longtime quarterback, especially a dual-threat guy, you're, like, licking your chops to get back at quarterback, and they're, you know – thinking they like me with it, what they saw in the slot the last year and all this, you know, all this stuff. So um, we went back and forth about it. And ultimately I just, I just said my last year, I'd love to give it one more shot, one more go at Q. And, and um, I was able to do some cool stuff again with some different packages. And I was able to do some cool stuff on special teams and field goal. And we, were, we did all kind of fancy two point plays and stuff like that. So I found an interesting role, but you know, you never, you never see a guy like McKenzie coming out of the woodwork and doing what he did. So that was really cool to be able to, you know, be in the quarterback room with him and, and, and have, you know, some mentorship there and um, strike a friendship with, with him and, and the other guys and see him really flourish. And, and um, you know, so it was cool. I, I did think, you know, halfway through the year and looking back, I would have loved to have experienced that maybe playing receiver and see what that could have turned into. And, and especially, you know, McKenzie gets hot and, as a special year and that would have been fun to play for receiver but um yeah it was it was an interesting back and forth but ultimately i'm glad glad i gave it a run at q yeah you did get in a game at michigan after holman gets hurt and what was the score of the game by the time you got in there man i think uh shoot i think we were only down by three points or something like that i want to say oh, so it was right away it was early then it was, it was early. Right yeah, it, was, it was right at the beginning i want to say it was like the second drive of the game something yeah because we were down like 28 nothing in like the first five minutes i felt like <laughs> yeah it was, it was quick <laughs> oh yeah you're telling me yeah it was um it was quick though i think it was like the second drive of the game that he went down and i went in and we think when we when i go in we go down we kick a field goal we get three really pretty quickly after like four plays and then yeah we didn't do a ton else that game but uh really cool experience that's for sure um i hang my hat on that game as uh, just kind of a memory i mean what a, what a cool experience playing in the big house and you know, not as competitive as we, as we would have hoped, but cool experience nonetheless. Well, Frost said you guys out hit him that day, right? So we, we had that going for yeah. us. Um, we might have if he was on the field. <laughs> <laughs> how, how hard is that, though? Like, they always say next man up and you're one play away. But, I mean, realistically, every play, you're not like, this is my play, this is my play. How hard is that as a backup where you're charting plays, you're calling plays in, you're talking to your teammates, and all of a sudden they're like, Patty, get your helmet. Like, how, how hard is that to flip the switch and just run on the field and be ready? It's brutal, man. Yeah, it's, it's really tough. I mean, all the – all the cliches that you hear, like, you know, one man, one play away, next man up. It's You can't really put that into, like, a practice script. You can't really, like, you know, synthesize that in a practice. And so it's it's pretty tough. Luckily, I was, you know, throughout my career was kind of able to get a feel for, you know, having a little bit of playing time and then coming in, coming out, doing the receiver thing. So I was somewhat used to that, like, you know, in and out type of environment um but that type of game at you know in the big house the second drive um you can't replicate that i mean that's that's uh it's pretty brutal it takes a drive or two um you know but also i think it's it's important that, like you don't have time to really think about it right it's like you grab your helmet you're here you're getting to play everyone else is already on the field in the huddle you know and and you're now you're in the huddle so it's like you don't have time to really think about the situation you're in you just kind of grip it and rip it um 
I certainly don't. I don't. Um, I don't remember a time that I I, I, I would have had it any other way. You know, I, I used to love that adrenaline rush. Obviously, you always want to be the guy that's playing. You don't want to be the guy that's one one play away. But I, it's, it's always nice to get your number called. I want to frame this next question up for maybe people who forget. So 2016, after the Michigan game, the, the third game of the year, we have Maryland coming to town. Again, it's the third game of the year. Mackenzie Milton has not yet stepped on the field. We have no idea what Mackenzie at least is from a fan base standpoint. Holman's out. He's not going to play. And word comes out that Mackenzie is going to start. Again, true freshman. Um was there any part of you? I know you're a team player, and I know listening to you talk so far, I know you want to be there for your team, you want to do the right thing. Was there any part of you that was like, we're going to start a true freshman? Like, you know, Scott, give me a chance here. Let me let me get on the field. Was there any part of you that was disappointed that they tapped McKenzie on the shoulder and, and didn't give you an opportunity in that in that Maryland game? Yeah, that was I think probably the most frustrating point, maybe maybe of the, my career, I'd say, and I say that with all due respect to the coaching staff, and you know, obviously. A zero reflection on, you know, McKenzie or anybody else, but um, you know, just having been put in the situation against Michigan, where you know I, it may not have been the best showing on on everybody's part, I was really looking forward to an opportunity to maybe go into that week, prepare as a starter, you know, walk in fresh slate against Maryland, big home game, you know, so it's it was really depleting for me to you know turn around have McKenzie play. I get it, you know, and and. Going into that season, you kind of knew at some point in the year Mackenzie was going to get a shot. He's just a special kid. Everybody has seen it by now, and what he's done is is, is uncomparable. But you know, I, that was I didn't think it would be then. You know, so it's, it was a little frustrating. But at the same time, I'm sure glad they did it because the kid's a special player. Well, yeah. Then so not to rub salt in the wound here, we uh, obviously Mackenzie struggles against Maryland. I think he had five fumbles that game. Uh, but yeah. we, we we lose in a close one. We lose in a heartbreak in overtime. Next week, we throttle FA, uh, FIU. rather. The next week, Holman comes back. We play East Carolina. He struggles, but we play well. And then at that point, another quarterback switch back to McKenzie. Was that another point where you were like, hey, like, g- give me an opportunity? Obviously, I mean, McKenzie hadn't been playing perfect at that point. Again, I know we know what he later became to do, but his early games were certainly true freshman-esque, right? Holman not, not maybe clicking and maybe dealing with injuries. I mean, if that had to be the point where you were like, Scott, like, like, let's go. Give me, give me an opportunity here. Yeah, that, that was, especially after FIU, because I got to play like the whole, most of the second half and somewhat lit it up and scored a couple of times and, and we just looked really good. And so that was a frustrating time. Cause it's like, you know, at, at what point does it, do we, do we stop doing this circus? You know, if, but there was also one of the factors in that was McKenzie was dealing with an injury. And so it was, you know, it was the FIU game. And then after the East Carolina, you know, it was like it, at, at some point he's going to come back. It's just a matter of his health, but yeah, it was frustrating for sure. Um, and that's that's definitely the time you wish that you maybe would have stayed a receiver and, and uh, just been playing the entire time, not had to worry about it. But um, no, it was a it was a trying season, that's for sure. But again, an awesome season because you're coming off of 0 and 12, and then you know you get to experience some of those things. So, well, take us behind the scenes. How does that is that does a coach sit down with you and tell you, hey, we're going with McKenzie? Is it just you go up to practice the next day and McKenzie's QB one? Like, how how do you receive the news that that's the direction they're going to go in? Yeah, every stop's a little bit different. Um, you know, I think depending, like, what you know, when we were going into Penn State, I think we all found out, you know, a couple days before we had we had a group meeting about it, you know, and then, so, like, that situation, typically, you know, you walk into meetings that morning and you're reading through the scripts and you're going to talk through how practice is going to go and then someone will say, hey, Mackenzie's taking these reps, you're taking these reps, and then, I'll, and then you know where you stand immediately because it's, you know, you're, you're running with the twos, he's running with the ones, okay. So, and then, you know, usually throughout the week, not to say everyone's different so much, but throughout the week at some point, everybody's got their time, whether it be the walkthrough meeting on Thursday or, you know, Wednesday night meetings, whatever it may be. So but th- that time it was usually whenever, whenever you were taking reps and practices where you were going to fall. So as the season goes on, it becomes obvious that, uh, Frost is going to roll at McKenzie, and he's the freshman. He's going to build for the future now. Uh, well, what do, you, what do you do as a backup? How, how do you support him behind the scenes in practice? What are you doing to, to help him out as the season goes along? Yeah, it was a unique opportunity for me because you kind of, I mean, I was, obviously, as we've highlighted, it's pretty clear cut the way they're going. 
him and Frost had a really cool relationship. Mackenzie, you know, caught a streak later on, but you know, this is just going to be their guy they're going to run with. And, and he's a really young kid. He's, he's from Hawaii. He's got no, you know, his family was there a lot, but he's got no, no family there. So it was a cool opportunity for me as an older guy. I wanted to take him under my wing socially, personally, just be able to support him, you know, me being older and well, graduated, you know, at this time. And so being able to support him, kind of walk him through what college life is all about. And, and um, you know, I think from a position standpoint, having a unique perspective, having played multiple positions, played in multiple schools, shoot, I think I played for like five different offense coordinators, you know, so like how to learn the offense, how to compartmentalize. And those are things, especially as a true freshman, you just can't play to your fastest ability. You can't play to pull out because your brain's working so hard. So I really tried to take it out of my wing to try to help him on the mental side of things, how to compartmentalize, learn the playbook, how to slow it down a little bit you know, how to prepare for a team because, you know, going into a week and preparing for a defense, there's so much data. I mean, if you could see the packets of information that they give you, it's like just information overload. As a young kid, I remember looking at these like, man, do I have have to know all this stuff? Am I supposed to walk up and know all these percentages and every down and distance and the percentage that they're in this look and that? So it was a cool opportunity for him and I to go through the year. Um, You know, and Justin and Pete and guys that, you know, we had a pretty veteran group in, in the room, um, you know, for us to all go through it and, and um, help him kind of slow it down, compartmentalize and support a young guy that uh, was really, really talented. We all, we all sort of knew it early on. So after that Arkansas State Bowl game where we just got beat up, if I tell you that team's going undefeated the next season, what do you say back to me? I say no way. <laughs> I mean <laughs> – I say that with a grain of salt, and I, I def, I, we just, I mean, that was so unprecedented, no doubt about it, and, and I, I, it was awesome that they did that. You know that there's a ton of talent on that team, but the team was not that many pieces away. That undefeated team was not that many pieces away from the 0-12 team. I mean, it was four or five guys away from the team, you know, as far as the core group. Um, and then the eight and five team, I mean, you're one or two pieces away from a team that just got smoked by Arkansas state, you know? So, and it was just unprecedented. And I think, you know, it's a testament to what Frost and those guys did really quickly in recruiting because, you know, the core pieces were pretty much the same, but they added a couple pieces that were, you know, killer. Um, and McKenzie doing what he did and, and having a really, really steep, inclined to the top, you know, and um, didn't see that coming at all. But, you know, you got guys like Michael Kubiali who step up on that team and end up being, you know, a world beater for that football team, you know, and, and, and the same guys that were on the offensive line are, are crushing it. And Wyatt Miller turns out to be a stud left tackle, you know, and, and it, the, the Griffin twins are, are there, you know, and, and it's, it was just a really cool thing to see those guys that, you know, a lot of guys are on that 0 12 team come to life and, able to showcase their talent that was pretty cool well obviously you mentioned you were you know on the sort of the doorstep of, of UCF uh their, their upswing back uh, after the 0 and 12 season uh and obviously we know what happened in 17 and, and 18 but UCF's in a bit of an interesting spot now obviously uh Frost moved on and, and Josh Heupel came in and you know uh some solid seasons obviously another New Year's Six Bowl but last two seasons have been uh, I guess a, a tad down from where we were and then Gus Malzahn comes in. What are your thoughts on the on UCF now, kind of transitioning from Heupel to, Mal, to Malzahn? What are your What are your expectations for the new Gus Malzahn era of UCF? I think it's huge, man. I, I think it's 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 the best thing that UCF could have gone out and done. And you know, I think anytime you can go out and court someone like Gus Malzahn that's coming from Auburn and has had the success that he's had at that program. Um, they are the example of college football. Or, you know, they're one of the premier programs in college football right now. And, you know, getting a, us being able to court him, it really puts us in a stage where, you know, we've had a lot of talk back and forth. Is, it, is this is UCF belong? Are they supposed to be here? Is it Are they for real? And I think us landing Gus on a guy like him, proves that, you know, and it puts us at the seat of the table and it's our – opportunity now to prove it and i think with some of this conference realignment and you got texas and oklahoma leaving you know to go to the sec and 
um, some movement. This is really our opportunity to do kind of what Boise State has done and to prove year after year and be there and not lose three games, not lose to Tulsa every year, you know, and, and, and throw yourself out of the mix. Um, and so I, I'm really excited about it because I think, one, it brings the spotlight to the program with having a name like him associated. He's a great coach. He's got an unbelievable staff that he's put together and brought to UCF. He's already grown the program. You know, as far as what we're able to do financially, as far as our outreach, recruiting has been unbelievable of what he's been able to bring in with some transfer kids. And so, you know, when when you see, I think the biggest thing with bringing in a guy like Gus Malzahn, what he can do, it's very evident very quickly. He's got a couple kids that follow him from Auburn. He's got a cut kids from all over the country that transfer in. He's has a really good recruiting class and that's not a mistake that's because he is the real deal and, and i'm excited for what's ahead of ucf i think it's going to be a different look pretty similar to hypo offensively where they're just heavy on the run game very fast pace um but i think it fits really well in our conference i think his his offense fits really well in the american conference and what we face every week up front um and I think we have the pieces on the roster to fit what he likes to do in some formations and some, you know, uses that little rover fullback. I think we've got some cool pieces for that. And, um, yeah, I think it'll be really interesting to see what he does with the talent pool at UCF. Well, let's talk about a position you know a lot about quarterback, obviously Dylan Gabriel. Uh, you, you've seen him play for the last two seasons. Uh, you know, as a true freshman, had a great year uh, last year, even though we only played 10 games and there was some up and down COVID stuff, right? Still had a really solid year. What do you want to see Dylan do in year three? What steps do you think he needs to take to continue to further his game? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's hard to pick anything out that, that he's really – had a shining inability to do. I mean, the kid is just extremely talented, right? And he's, he's worked so well within the offense. I, I think one of the biggest differences that I'd like to see is that we, and what I expect to be the biggest difference in the offense is I think Gus's offense has a lot of play action, smoke and mirrors that Heupel's offense did, but Heupel's offense was a lot of shots. Dylan's got a great deep ball. He's got an unbelievable ability to, to turn the ball over. Um, I think it'll be cool to see some of the intermediary passes, you know, the underneath stuff, crossing routes, some man beaters, stuff like that, that the outside one-on-one routes that I think Gus mixes in a little bit more than Heupel did. So it'll be interesting to see some of the concept stuff um, come into play for for Dylan. I I don't know exactly one thing I could say that he needs to get better at, Um, you know, maybe – I think he was extremely mobile and you hate to have a guy be too mobile, you know, nowadays just because you want to elongate guys' careers. And we've had, we've seen what QB, you know, injuries can do to us in the past, but, um, you know, just for, I think this year for him to build his ability to move the chains, keep the chains moving with being a little bit mobile, but not doing too much with his feet, letting the running backs do their deal on the ground. Um, and like I said, some of those intermediary, intermediary passes that I think are, are just, you know, first down getters and, and defense killers uh, are going to be important. Nick, what have you been up to since uh, your career came to an end? Are you, get, are you still involved in football at all, or what are you doing? Um, not, not so much, man. I've done a little bit of this stuff, done some podcasts and stuff like that. I, uh, I've thought about coaching a little bit. I have helped out with some camps and stuff along the way, but um, I'm living down in Jupiter and, and in the private private sector now, and I own a business and doing that stuff. So maybe one day I might jump back into it, but haven't, haven't since. Yeah. You definitely have the experience. You've mentioned playing under five different offensive coordinators in college. I'm sure you know <laughs> a lot of different systems. So I've still got all the books in my garage. So I can, <laughs> I can crack them out at some point. <laughs> all right. So the big season opener coming up in a couple of weeks. Are you going to be at that game? I will be there with bells on. I don't know what color I'm going to wear yet, but uh oh. <laughs> that was going to be my next question. There, you can't com- be considering wearing blue and orange. You know, at home. I definitely wouldn't. Would not even think about doing that. Um, I've got some really good friends on on the Boise State staff that are uh, one of which is one of my best friends. But he, uh, no, it, it'll be it'll be cool. I'll, I'll be be rooting for the Knights there. And, you know, I graduated from UCF, hometown team. You know, I have a special place for Boise in my heart, but I, I, I'm going to be I'm, – I'm definitely a knight. We almost had to delete this whole conversation. If you were <laughs> right. <saying that>. yeah. <laughs> that, was, 
kidding. That was a big waste of time. Um, well, yeah, so if you, have, if you have some friends on the staff, give us a give us a scouting report. What what should we expect uh, from Boise State? Obviously, they have a new off- offensive coordinator this year. Uh, I think they're third in three seasons. Uh, what do you what do you expect from this game from uh, from Boise? Yeah, I, I think that they're going to have a lot of excitement. So uh, Andy Avalos, their head coach, he is a he's a live wire man. So I'd expect on the defensive side of the ball for them to bring a ton of pressure. I'd expect for them to bring some really exotic looks. They've got some guys on their staff that um, have some crazy defensive experience with some interesting um, staffs and and playmakers. So Winston Venables on their staff. He played in the Canadian League. He played at Boise State. He's sort of a Troy Palomalu type player, and I'm sure he'll have some some doodads for them. And he was a player linebacker at Boise State. He was on Oregon staff on the defensive side. So um, I think we're going to get some really interesting looks. I think it's going to be a different type of ball from them on the offensive side of the ball. I'm not crazy familiar with with what they're doing, but um, I think yeah, I, I definitely think they'll have some tricks up their sleeve. They got some some um, veteran talent on their team, and so it'll be interesting to see as we do, you know, and with some transfer kids. But you know, it's, it's the first time that our team is is together with this head coach and with with Gus, and so it'll it'll be uh, an interesting matchup. Well, Dick, we appreciate you taking some time and walking down memory lane. But we, uh, before we let you out of here, we uh, we end every conversation with some random rapid fire questions. Could be music, movies, sports. Uh, could be anything at all. So, so here's my first one for you. In your time at UCF, in your three seasons there, who was the one teammate that if you needed to to laugh, that you would call this guy and he'll make you laugh? Who's the funniest guy that you were around? Oh man, Mark Rucker. Major, okay. <laughs> well, I think I've heard somebody else say that before too. I'm sure you have. He's hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we've mentioned him a few times already this interview. But did you know that today is George O'Leary's 75th birthday? Um, yeah. Yeah. If you had to get him a birthday gift, what would you get him? Man, a giant box of Redmond chewing tobacco. <laughs> 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 I, I don't know if he goes through it. I, I, well, yeah, that, he may. That may last until tomorrow. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, right. I don't know if you're aware of this, Nick, but there is a quarterback for Pittsburgh who's also named Nick Patty. Uh, he's been there. I'm aware. He's been there two years. Oh, yeah. He's played six games. Do you ever DM this guy and tell him, hey, like, don't screw up our good name or anything? Do you ever like give this guy Man, some, some I crap? I should because I get probably one or two texts a weekend about that guy. I swear, every time he plays, I get a couple texts. So I should definitely link up with him and tell him that uh, – He's repping for both of us. He yeah, really I mean, asked me if I got a six year of eligibility. Yeah, tell him not to screw up your good name. I mean, I mean, he's right? he's, he's played well. He's got three touchdowns, one int. He's played, looks spot duty. Yeah. Looks like, but you know, you want to keep I, that on track. No doubt, man. Yeah, he's got to he's got to represent. I need to hit him up. I need to hit him up. That's great. All right. So when you're at this tailgate party, getting ready for the opener. Uh, I, I've had this debate here. What's, what's your stance on hard seltzers? These high noons and these mm. trulies and stuff. Is that you or is that that's not what you're drinking? It's typically not, man. Especially a lot of them. If I'm gonna do any of them, it's, it's high noons because it's. I think they're better than the rest of them. I won't drink any of the other stuff. High noons is the only ones that I'll drink, but I can't do a lot of them. Maybe one or two on a hot day. Is it, you're not uh, drinking any real beers? Or? Um. Yeah, yeah, I would probably definitely drink real beers before I drank, before I drank seltzers. But high noons would probably uh, be the only thing other than real beers. But. Yeah, that happens. All right, uh, tr- true or false? Scott Frost polos were one size too small for him. True or false? True. Yeah, we all know, right? We don't know who he, who he was fooling with that yeah. stuff, right? Which is funny because like his sweatpants and t-shirts were like three sizes too big. <laughs> oh, but so the game day he rolls out in like the the game skinny pants. Yeah, and, okay, I yeah, see what he's doing sure. there. Okay, okay. We we like we, didn't your teammates like want to have him as like a wingman just to to go out and pick up chicks because he he was probably oh, like the, the one guy who could probably be the the best wingman you guys had. Man, and you never you don't know the guy looks like he's like twenty eight years old. It was funny when they for the staff first got there and like all the seniors we always used to go downtown and I remember having a conversation with that the new staff and some of the younger guys and some of the older guys on the team and they're like if you guys see us anywhere out and about 
do not come up and talk to us. Like, we know you guys go downtown. We're going downtown. We don't know you while we're down there. So do your own thing. I remember that conversation. (laughs) 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 Uh, If you could have one superpower, what would it be? If I could? Yeah. Man, probably flying. I think flying. Probably make make life a lot easier or being invisible. One of those two. It's not bad. It's not a bad choice, Nick. And uh, and look, we definitely appreciate you uh, you joining us. Obviously, having some some fun leading up to to UCF Boise. Uh, Mike and I will be at the game. We have a tailgate like right outside the stadium. So uh, make sure you, you stop by. You can't miss us on the way in. So stop by, say hello, grab a grab a seltzer if you want. You know whatever whatever, whatever you need on the way into the stadium. But uh, thanks for having some fun with us and uh, and giving us some breakdown of your time at UCF, man. Uh, Mike and I talk to a lot of guys, and and we always say we have a bunch of respect for. The guys who stood, you know, stood tall in that 14, 15, 16 era, uh, because to your point, it had been so easy to leave after 15 and just say, okay, this is not not going anywhere. But uh, everybody who kind of stuck in there and uh, and and stayed the course uh, really paved the way for UCF today, man. So ultimate respect to you and all the guys who who stuck in that 15 year and and ultimately led UCF to the turnaround we're at today. Dad, De- definitely appreciate that. Awesome, man. I appreciate that. That's uh, really appreciate you saying that. And all, UCF's a great school. It's great place to be great place to be an alumni of really appreciate you guys having me on man this was a lot of fun this is going to be an exciting matchup it's going to be an exciting year in general but week one is special to me obviously uh extra so it's going to be exciting to watch well actually we didn't we didn't get a prediction i don't think from you 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 gave us a breakdown we almost let you out of here without a prediction uh nick we're going to need something from you yeah i don't know i don't know if i can do the prediction thing man i i think uh weirdly enough i think it might be um Fairly high scoring game. I say that moderately. I'm saying, uh, I don't know, 28 24 UCF. Nice. Okay. All right. We'll, yeah, we'll, that's we'll what take I'm it. Going with. We'll take it. And if not, we will uh, we will find you and we will hold you accountable for that as always. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we appreciate your time and uh, best of luck to you. And hopefully we catch up with you at the game. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. All right. Go next. UCF head football coach Gus Malzahn, and you should listen to the sons of UCF like your hair is on fire. Go Knights and charge on. All righty, friends. Cow of the week. We appreciate you hanging in there, by the way. This is a bit of a long one, but it's preseason. You want to hear as much as you want to hear about games. You want to hear predictions. That's what we're here for, Mike. But what we can predict is there will be some cows, uh, and people have uh, caused us to look at them differently this week, Mike. And uh, your cow is no exception, Mike. Who has caught your ire this week? Oh, man. Sometimes I, this happens. You know, we go after our own guys. So last week, I think it was me, right? So sometimes yeah. we are cows, and some people that work for UCF sometimes are cows. I, I've named the basketball team cows, the baseball team. We've, we've gone through it. And now so one of our own media guys, I guess technically not a UCF media guy, but one of our local guys, and we discussed it earlier in the program, Matt Merchell, it's your turn, buddy. You <laughs> did not rank us in their top 25. You cover the team. You're a UCF uh, representative here on this poll. We need as much help as we can get. And it's made worse by having the Tampa guy, Matt Baker, actually put us in. And, you know, I don't know if you're just trying to uh, not seem biased, but you, you of all people should know that this team – uh, it is a top 25 team. We just went through the schedule breakdown. We're going to be undefeated. I mean, let's, let's get real here. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be 12 and 0. We're talking about orange bowls and the cotton bowls and where we're going to end up, who we're playing in the playoff. So get with the program. I know you now, is he off the UCF beat? No, is Jason Beatty taking over his spot now at the, uh, yeah, no, I believe, that happened already? I, no, I believe it's, uh, next week. I believe Beatty will do UCF specifically and that Michelle will be more of their national college football voice. So he is not going to be at the press conferences anymore. Is this what I'm taking out of this or it's, it's, it's uh, very unlikely. It sounds like he will be at the press conference. Man. So maybe this is the reason he didn't rank us anymore. Maybe, maybe if he, he was to still be on the UCF beat. He, he would have thrown us a couple points here. But uh, he's got the whole season to make it up now, right? So I want him to be one of the first. After we beat Boise, I better see a ranking out of him or else I'm going to be upset and I'm going to have Trace rip his bow tie off at the next press conference. 
Wow. Uh, it's uh, so Michel is listed again. They try to list the biases for each of these guys. He's listed as dual for UCF and Florida State. Did not rank either of them. If that helps, Mike does have the Gators lower though. He has the Gators at what is that? Five, ten, fifteen, I think. Uh, so he's got the Gators ranked a little lower. What's funny is they have Matt Baker, who you mentioned is from the uh, Tampa. Hold on, let me get his newspaper appropriate here. Tampa Bay Times. They have his affiliations listed as the Gators and the Seminoles. So, so they don't even list <laughs> the cows as, as one of his affiliations. Yeah, I did enjoy that too. I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah, we, we are Tampa's hometown team also, and he knows that. So hmm. good for him. Bad job out of Matt. Bad job out of Matt. Yeah, I mean, like Matt, he seems like a nice guy. You know, maybe he's just trying to do the right thing on, a, on an early early poll. Uh, we'll give him the benefit of the doubt. He came on the live show those ones. was very, very nice. I think he's done a nice job covering UCF for the last couple of, of, of off seasons. He's done some good coverage, asked some good questions. I've always enjoyed his background of the Zoom calls. So I'll... I, I, we'll just get maybe this is a warning, a slap on the wrist for for Matt as cow of the week because I, I, you know, maybe we, we we may need him later on down the year uh, to to help us out. So maybe this is Matt just trying to trying to ease us into it. Maybe he has a twenty seven, you know, right? And we're just we're just off his list, Mike. Um, I have a bunch of things I wrote down for cow of the week, so I got I got two really quickly. And then this is really weird because I, I I one one sense I, I enjoy, but one sense I don't. Uh, first cap preseason football, Mike preseason NFL. What are we doing? Like, God, is that so bad to watch? I'm so excited. Cause I'm like, Oh, football's on. And then I turn it on. I'm like, Oh, it's like this guy I've never heard of thrown to this guy. I've never heard of. I understand you got to warm it up, man, but uh, preseason football, I just, I don't know. I'm, I'm really trying to really want to get excited about it, but I don't know. I, I can't, I, 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 it's, I'm, I'm having a hard time having a hard time. It's been that way for as long as I can remember. Yeah. The giants were on the other night. I, <laughs> I recorded it. So it's like I watch it the next day or whatever. And I, I put it on for about three plays. I couldn't watch it anymore. No, nobody was playing. The entire offense had the day off. So uh, whatever. It's a necessary evil, I guess. For and, and it's cool for guys that we know. Guys like Jacob Harris had a, a good game yes, the other yeah. night. He got some exposure. Um, Shaquem forced a fumble for the I Dolphins did, yeah. the other day, too. Did, yeah. So guys like that trying to make a roster, that's what it's there for. But to actual entertain yourself with football – uh, no thanks. Yeah, it just gets, uh, it's really hard. And then, so here's my other cow. And this may be controversial, Mike. I don't really know. My other cow of the week, the Little League World Series. Are we oh, still, wow. are we still doing that? Here's the thing. I, on my TV this weekend, it wasn't like, wasn't the like Williamsport edition. You know, it was, it was like the sub regional final of like, you know, uh, the, the Northern California region or something. Like now we're televising like the lead up to the lead up to the lead up of the Little League World Series. The Little League World Series itself is, is okay. You know, if you don't have a, a, a city or a, a town team that's in it, sometimes it doesn't have the same, same excitement. But now we're doing like the pre, like the, the pre tournament to the pre tournament to the qual. Like I, I don't, I don't know what I'm watching anymore. I feel like the Little League World Series used to be like, like a week. And now it's on for like six months. I, I don't. I don't know why that's happening. So little league world series. I think we're doing a little bit too much. A little bit too much of the pre-tournament stuff. Again, I'm okay with the actual little league world series. I don't watch all those games because there's a lot of them on. Uh, but uh, little league world series. I, I don't know. Are you into little? League? Is it? Is this? Is this a hot take that I'm anti little league world series? Uh, I haven't really watched it in a long time. Now, to be honest, I used to watch it. I used to watch it growing up. Obviously, when I was playing Little League, I followed it really closely. That was back with uh, Sean Burroughs, I think was the big name. The Long, what were they? Long Beach, California. I remember those teams. And even as I got a little older in high school, I still followed it. I haven't really followed it in a long time. Probably since the uh, Rolando Paulino All-Stars. <laughs> remember those guys? <laughs> they, who, was the, who was the pitcher they had that was like 25 years old? Uh, uh, Danny something or other, right? Danny Almonte. Yeah. There you go. Danny Almonte. That was, I think when we were in college, it's probably one of the last times I watched maybe here or there. I, I catch a game if it's on, but yeah, I don't follow too much, but you know, the, them showing the earlier rounds, that's just ESPN looking for stuff to put on TV and people watch that stuff, I guess. So they put it on. It's probably all over that ESPN uh, app. I'm sure you can watch I, I don't even know. probably games that are going on in your backyard right now. 
and a lot of this is going to be, I, I, as I referenced last week, I had a lot of quarantine time, so I, I couldn't leave the house. So I was home at hours that I normally wouldn't have been home at. And I was like, oh, it looks like PTI is on. I haven't watched PTI in like 10 years. Let me, oh, no, we'll leave World Series. Okay. All right. Hey, oh, it looks like uh, Sports Center. Oh, no. Okay. That's the League World Series. It felt like it was always on no matter where I was. The last time I remember watching the Little League World Series, I don't know if you remember this. I think we were in, we were definitely in UCF. I think a Popka um, was a, I think they got to the uh, the U.S. finals uh, that year, obviously it being in Orlando, near Orlando. I think that's the last time I recall watching. I think we lived in a boardwalk then. So that had been like junior, senior year. Um, I feel like a popka made a run. I think we watched that entire thing for some reason. Yeah, and I think shortly after, or right around that time, also there was a team from Boynton Beach. Yes, yes, correct. Or Delray it was Boynton. Was yeah. Boynton, yep. And they and they went pretty far. I think they got to the final too. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it, it's good for the yeah, kids. It's a local all, team. Yes, but there's just a lot of it on all of a sudden, and I don't know who's what anymore, and I don't know what I'm doing, and. It, it's just a lot going on. So Little League World Series, just a little bit too much. I mean, give me give me a couple of games. I don't need like 35 of them. Give me like maybe like seven uh, and uh, and we'd be all set. So I guess my cow of the weeks are just things that are on my TV getting in the way. And again, this just tells you I had way too much time to watch TV the last two weeks. So uh, so hopefully we'll get back to some normalcy where I don't have to watch all the TV. Uh, but what I will be watching, Mike, is uh, I'll be watching for additional news and notes out of UCF practice. Again, news off the top that RJ Harvey could be injured. Uh, so we will probably touch on that and a host of other topics Thursday night on the live show here on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube. Make sure you're following our accounts. You can find that or go to two nights media.com and you can join me and trace and whoever the heck Trace uh, decides to book this week. You never know who you're going to get. I don't know if trace will be on the show. This week. actually trace's internet probably should have been cow of the week. Oh yeah. I forgot about that. Somebody did nominate him earlier. Uh, all right, trace your cow of the week too. Or, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Comcast or whatever internet provider you have. Um, but you know what we haven't mentioned this whole episode, which has been a long episode. I know. Our tailgate. tailgate. Party. I, knew, I, was, I knew it was coming up. Yeah. Take it away. Um, yeah. You know where to find us. September 2nd. There it is. <laughs> for the Boise State. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I put out a couple polls the last couple of days. You know, what's most important to people about tailgating? Is it the food, the drinks, the location, the games? Uh, that Everybody mostly just wants to go get drunk. That, that was the number one answer. Today I put out. What is the best tailgate game to play? And Cornhole, I believe, is winning right now. Cornhole, Flip Cup, uh, Beer Pong. This one guy, number, uh, his name is Drew Britton, I guess. He's at Drew Britton on Twitter. 89 Knight is his name. He brought up this game called Launch, which is, called, is spelled like Lawn, W, I mean L-A-W-N with a C-H at the end, Launch. And it's kind of like a, a spinoff of the Cornhole. And he's telling me he's bringing it. So we're going to maybe play our first ever launch game at this tailgate. Maybe a, a launch uh, tournament style. Winner gets a Sons of UCF hat. What do you think about that? I mean, looking at it now, yeah, I'm, I'm watching uh, uh, watching these guys play this. Um, yeah, I'm in for that. I mean, I, we gotta, I think we'll bring some hats, right? We'll bring, we'll bring some, some, some party gifts. Uh, these look like some pretty serious uh, uh, equipment you need here. This isn't just, you know, you're just not showing up with a football here. This is, uh, this is real to Holyfield right here. Well, yeah, it looks similar. It's similar to a cornhole game. So you got the boards and you got some bean bags, and uh, it's kind of a combination of cornhole and darts. Yeah. From what I, I'm seeing, so a different way to score this thing, but it should be fun. And if he's willing to bring it, I'm down to play. So, and if anybody else wants to bring some games, we're down to do that too. Yeah, beer pong and uh, flip cup. That should be easy enough. We have the tables. All we need is some solo cups yeah. and some beer. So that's good. Somebody wants to bring a football. Somebody wants to bring some frisbees. Uh, we'll have a good time out there, but you know, we'll be out there. We're planning to be there probably around two o'clock. That gives us a nice five hours leading off to kick off. <laughs> Don't even have to, <laughs> to pack up that early because we're that close to the stadium. So normally when I'm tailgating, uh, like an hour or at least 45 minutes beforehand, you got to start breaking down the tents. You got to start packing up the cooler, putting everything back in the car. We don't have to worry about any of that. So we can wait almost, you know, six forty-five if we want and just uh, leave our stuff there and just head right into the stadium, come back and pick it up later if we want. Well, that's the plan. That's that's the plan. And you guys want to be there again September 2nd, uh, right outside the stadium there. You can't miss us. I think there will be a big sign. Uh, some people have already mentioned they're going to be swinging by. Really excited to meet some people that we've never met before, Mike, uh, and people who have uh, listened to us for a long time or interact with us. So really excited can't wait to, to do that everybody uh make sure that you uh you stop by if you're going to be around you know uh, 
but we'd love to we'd love to hang out uh, and we'd love to hang out with you on Thursday night on the live show we'd love to hang out with you next week on the podcast we'd love you to follow us subscribe rate review do all the good stuff and uh, everybody be safe out there again we're 17 days away we are so close everybody be safe be healthy be happy uh, and hopefully uh, hopefully this thing will go off without a hitch Mike and uh, we'll we'll cover it all uh, as much as we can throughout the process for you so everybody have a fantastic week thanks for listening in and uh, I don't know Mike what go Knights charge on <laughs>